<laughs> All right, welcome to Beyond Breaking Barriers, y'all. I'm your host, Piper Carter. And if you have tuned in here at 8 p.m. Eastern at Black Power Media, you're about to have a conversation about women in hip hop as we usually do. This is a very, very exciting and special episode because I have none other than Burn It Down with Kim Brown. <laughs> Piper Carter podcast <laughs> beyond breaking barriers. You know, I actually sat and deeped for a second, like the title of the show, beyond breaking barriers, right? Yes, like, yes. Like women, black women, you know, gay folks, you know, we do break barriers, but what what happens beyond breaking the barrier? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I thought that was a what very What happens beyond that? Title. Mm -hmm. What happens after you finish twerking? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you change clothes, you take a shower, you go get you a, a sip, of, sip of some cool water, some lemon water. Yeah. Relax. So I really appreciate that you're here in the building. I'm going to just shout out the chat early. I see a lot of folks said that they uh, came here just to see you. Ooh. So this is like, very exciting. So I, I'm, I'm so grateful you came on to the show. I'm feeling like so blessed. I, I feel very so honored to be invited. I, I appreciate the level and uh, of discourse and conversation that you have on your show surrounding rap, hip hop, activism, you know, black, black people, black women. So I am just very, so, so humbled to be over here with you, Piper. Thank you so much for having me. Shout out to the Detroit. What? Yay. And shout yeah. out for, to Baltimore. You so how come for DMV, the whole, even, yes, the whole DMV. But thank you for denoting Baltimore separately, because that's how Baltimore views <laughs> itself as separate from the DMV. So you 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 did a very good thing right there. Well, I went to Howard. I, I, I'm a Howard. Oh, I'm a oh, HU. Oh, so you I know, know what time how, it is. How, in the 90s, okay, there was this club. Was it called Legends? There was a club called Legends, yes. So my ex-boyfriend went to Morgan. And I went to Howard. And so we used to, it was some club in Baltimore. That was my first time ever. Um, I think it was maybe like 91. And it oh, was wow. like, um, what was it? It's time for the percolator. <laughs> oh, you and, was there um, at a good time. <laughs> and what was the other? Um, follow Dude me. Brown. Oh, yeah. Follow me. And, um, oh, yeah, Duty Brown. And um, what's, it's another one that's a big it was a big ball. It was like these ball to me. Those are Baltimore, Baltimore. hits because mm -hmm. maybe it's because that's where the first time I heard them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So whenever I think of oh, and that hairstyle, that Baltimore hairstyle. Well, I don't know if y'all still do that, but it was like this top thing, and then it was like a swoop. Oh, and it was like from the sixties. I don't know what y'all call it. And sometimes they had like the curls, and then like it was See, like a, it was like a swoop thing, and then like a ponytail like like a bun was it the like top. the girl because i mean see fr french roll was we french rolling back then is that is um that so the french roll i see is like in the back yes this one was like in the top top eh and then and they went like up and then y'all used to wear those long earrings well you're a little younger but it was like these long kind of like um gold Shoulder earrings dusters? Okay. yes 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 and there were all types of like things on them they were so <laughs> oh. Woo. yeah this and the baltimore women like to fight oh listen i had to exit <laughs> baltimore city on a couple of nights <laughs> when when the baltimore girls had let me know that i have overstayed my county ass welcome girl you better get your ass back down to the tree line street <laughs> i said no problem girl i'm gone I'm gone. Y'all not jumping me out here in Baltimore tonight. Uh -uh. No, they like to fight. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you say that. No, funny I had story. I I didn't I had a fight like once in uh not the it was another club I don't remember the name and I had one in DC in my what? college days. I know that's terrible to admit. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, come on, like and, and listen, they it, it, it I think it's a good um, you know, period marker to remind. I mean, I know children fight, the young people fight out here today, but you know, the, 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 you, you could just throw hands out here. You know what I'm saying? People weren't always trying to stab or shoot. And, yeah. and don't get me wrong. There was a lot of stabbing and shooting when we were, oh, yeah. you know, of, of, of going out age as well, but not always. I mean, it could just be straight up throw them hands, you know? So 
Oh, Where let me tell you, you. What club was you fighting okay. in? Okay. I was trying to remember. I, the, the Baltimore one, I don't remember. And that mm -hmm. one was quasi fair. But the <laughs> one in DC. So, okay. I have this story time. So um, I'm a freshman. And it's after. So um, when you would go to school, like at Howard, the way they did it, you go like for the three weeks in the summer. As a from high school, like in August, a little orientation joint, little orientation. So no one's there but freshmen. And mm -hmm. so then when the school year starts, then they kind of things change, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I thought I had these little friends, right, uh, at Howard, and I was like a different culture because a lot of the young people that I was around were like the black kid that went to like a white school or they went or they were like from the suburbs. So they weren't really used to being around like urban mm -hmm. or hood people. And so I was like actually from the hood. Like I was like authentically <laughs> from the hood. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when you're from the hood, you don't like sell wolf tickets. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't do all that talking. It's just like, you know, you just go for it. So I didn't realize that they were like, they were going around the club, like saying all this weird stuff. And I was like, you know, people, you know, talky, talky stuff. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so one of the girls like bumped me. So I let it go. Cause I'm a hippie kind of, you know, hippie hood. So I was like, no, that's an accident. But she, but it was like you, she went back around. Cause it was like the those clubs when they be so packed, you go from room to room or in the line to come back. I have a feeling so I she, knew it, what club you were in, but go ahead. She bumped me again, <laughs> and it was like she bumped me so hard that I felt it in the base of my spine. And then I was like, it was all in one, and it was like my brain and my fist like all went at the same time. And then I was like, you know what? You might as well go all the way minus, <laughs> don't have acid minus well <laughs> so minus. that was it and then i like pounced on her <laughs> and then wait, but i was out, thinking that my no, friends no, 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 were wait, gonna wait, 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 wait. time out what? time out time out you're talking about <laughs> and, and that was it and no <laughs> well, what, what i mean happened? is what jaws i mean is, got rocked jaws got rocked you could well, say it mine okay. did too let me not oh, act shit. like i was okay so so i went all the way in but then, like, she, her people came on me, but my people mm. scattered like roaches. Mm. So it was me and like maybe four or five of them. I can't tell. Damn. But what, so long story short, by the time I, we were all done, I had two black eyes down to the oh. white meat. <laughs> oh. Oh. It was like down oh. to the white meat. And they was, I looked like a raccoon. And that then, was like, rumbling, rumbling. Oh, that because, because they used to remember the, oh, you, you too young. They used to have the steel toe shoes and they was kicking me in my face with them steel toe shoes. Damn, Piper, you got to do a, like a fight fight. Oh, a yeah. Fight. Oh, yeah. And then, like, so that was a Friday. And I went back to school on Monday, right? And I just put, like, my little Vaseline. I know, Vaseline's terrible. It's made of gasoline, plastic, or whatever. But back then, we used to use Vaseline. So mm -hmm. I put the Vaseline on there. I went to class. And everywhere I went, people were... So somehow, you know how, like, the telephone game? So somehow or other, instead of me getting beat up by five people... People thought I beat up the five people. And then when they saw me and I had the two black eyes and I didn't have sunglasses, I was going to school. So then I got this little reputation that I was like crazy. You know, I was like, leave her alone. Oh, then I was like, okay, cool. Let me roll with it. <laughs> as a freshman, no less, right? Oh, you as a me? freshman. I, man, I, I had a lot of upperclassmen like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but I was like, I was so angry because I was like, I went to, I mean, I in my mind i'm like i came to college to escape this you know mm -hmm. i came to college to get away from this you know i came to howard i'm thinking i'm gonna be you know and then i get to school but my but i learned later that like a lot of the young people they were acting like they thought how black people should act mm -hmm. so they were like bring and i was like no 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 we don't like try to fight people <laughs> that's not acting black <laughs> Wow. And see, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm also trying to re remember DC in 1991, right? Like DC, it was a, it was a little rickety at the time as a, as folks would say, I even think. It was Chocolate City. 
it was Chocolate City, but even 91 might have been one of those years that DC was murder, murder cap. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, it was. It was. It was. Yeah. And, 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 and you know what? That's how I learned how to speak DC in. Cause like, <laughs> I, I, like, cause, cause the accent, I was like, huh? It was like, you know, when guys try to holler at you and you walk down the street and they was like, hey, show, then jump down high, And I'm like, huh? <laughs> well, I was like, what language is that? <laughs> and my, my DC friends had to say, oh, he's saying, hey, short, shorty, but he's saying shoddy. Them, them jones with Johns. Them J Johns. Oh, well, no, Johns is silly. like hype. Jones. Jo yes. Oh, my Jones. God. That's okay, really good. Wait, that is it Jones? Is it, wait, the Jones is Philly and the Jones is DC? That is correct. Remember. That is okay. correct. So, John, right. uh, J-A-W-N, <laughs> that, that's yeah. Philly. That's Philly. Jones. Joan, Joan, I have, I did do, I have, there, there's been debates on how to properly spell Joan. I spell Joan, J O U N T S. Joan. Them Jones. You know what okay. I'm saying? Okay. So when I went to Philly, I was like, oh, I'm like, oh, this, the slang is just, just, just slightly different. There was only mm -hmm. slight, like, slight differences from DMV slang to Philly slang. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, look at us cousins, Philly, shout out yeah. to Philly. But, yeah. but I totally, I totally learned how to speak DC. And after that, after that, I was like, oh, I got it. I got it. DC in. I don't know. <laughs> Washingtonian. Oh, that's funny. No, because oh. Washingtonians are different now. That's right. That, Washingtonian, that's, right. that's another species you got of black it. fish. You got it. No, Washingtonians, <laughs> black Washingtonian. Because and, and these are the people, these are the Jacqueline Luke moms of the world that are quick to tell you that the rest of y'all mm -hmm. little county niggas, you little Jared Balls and Kim Browns out there, y'all not from DC. <laughs> y'all from y'all from <laughs> out there. Y'all are so the difference is car uh Piper, I'm about to call you Carter. Lord have murdered Miss Carter, Miss Carter. <laughs> so it's, it's it's people from DC and then specifically from Maryland, it is Maryland Bamas, right? We are right, I, right. Am, I am a Maryland Bama, and Bama is kind of a derogatory term, yes. But you, 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 you embrace it as a badge, you know. No, gotcha, no, I am yeah. a Maryland Bama, I'm not one of these people fake claiming to be from DC, I am from Maryland, so there's a difference, <laughs> and, <laughs> a and also, too, is curry, curry, and <laughs> <laughs> it's not curry on your food. No. It's like that. Don't care, curry me, shawty. Don't be curry me, shawty. <laughs> Paper, I seldom do you hear people. I mean, forget you know the region because uh, maybe, but you are from a whole nother the, 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 the time zone out here, and you have got this slang down. I am quite. Well, I used to be at the um, go go's in uh, Southeast. <laughs> wow. When, I remember I was in a go go in Southeast. And this girl bit this man, this man's ear off, and she spit it out on the floor. And and I was frightened. And then she was like, "You with me? We you okay?" I was like, "Lord, have she had blood everything on her mouth?" She's like, "I'll be back." I was like, "Whoa!" Oh, <laughs> that's funny you say that, right? Because I I was thinking about these these days, these these you know my my teenage, late teenage, early adulthood days, and the go go's, right? And like mm -hmm. it was certain go go, like there were certain places I'm not going, like I'm not going to the black hole i'm not going to the ice box like they're like probably wherever you was at the go-go yeah, the black going hole down that i'm from that in detroit so i was like oh, oh this is normal <laughs> wow so i was like okay i feel at home you know <laughs> now let me but, ask you a question yeah. about detroit right because mm -hmm. everybody that i've ever met from detroit or michigan is is very cool. Only person I don't like from that area is my is one of my in laws. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like, every, how come everybody else from Detroit is cool except this person is a, is a fucking jerk? But um, is it true that black women in Detroit, especially a lot of them, carry guns? Is that accurate? oh most people, most everybody, grandma got a gun. Everybody, <laughs> auntie, she probably got a nickel plated twenty two in her purse with a piece of candy. Oh, you shit. know. And a tissue, some tissue. And a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go in that purse. Tissue. Don't go in her purse. Tissue. Leave my purse alone. Love it. I love that. I well, honestly, there's it's, something... it's legal here. And yeah. now we, now we have, um, what's that called? Um, open, open carry. carry. Mm -hmm. And um, the first time I saw open carry was in Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Story time. 
Uh-oh. So <laughs> I was my first time going to Texas was probably late 90s. Mm-hmm. And I went to Dallas. And um <clears throat> my whole other life, I used to be a fashion photographer, went there oh. with um the crew, and I was the only black person, only person from the United States. These Europeans, they were all from France and Italy in a fashion world. They were very excited to be in Texas. I was I'm, not. I'm I love chill. y'all. I know it's a lot of <laughs> black people in Texas, but wherever we were, I didn't see none of them. Mm. <laughs> and we're, we went to this vintage place because we were doing this story for Vogue because Levi's had just found this warehouse that had all this original dark denim from like the 1800s and so this vintage place was like selling it and it was like thousands of dollars i don't know if you remember that it was like late 90s they started selling all that you know 900 dollar levi's suits anyway so um they went there to like do this photo shoot and all this stuff so they were like you want to come in and i was like yeah i'm cool so i go so long story short i saw some uh kind of cowboy looking white guy walked past me with one of those typical big hat big you know 10 gallon hat and the cowboy boots and the whole thing and a gun that was probably like this like big and i was like you mm. know what i'm going to go inside <laughs> <laughs> i'll go inside so i go inside and as soon as i get in there it was the biggest confederate flag i've ever seen in the history of confederate it was the whole wall wow and not only that, the guy I was working for, this guy from Rome, he comes to me. There was like a mannequin. And he goes, bye, bro, come here. I want to show you something. And so we go to the, I go to this mannequin. It's this freaking vintage KKK robe. And like, it was like, you know, like when fabric, um, I guess like a twill or a, it's like that really It was actually a really beautiful fabric. I was pissed Mm. off about that. But uh, it was like the original like embroidery, but it was like pristine. Mm. And it was on the mannequin. It had all the insignia, like the whole situation. It scared Mm. the bejesus out of me. Mm. And I was like, and he goes like, isn't it beautiful? I was like, what? Shit. He was talking about like the 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 stitching. I was like, oh, he's like, this is from your history. Oh you my should god! Be happy. I was like, oh my Frederico, god. Frederico, get the fuck out my face, Frederico. <laughs> 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 Did you tell Frederico? You don't understand what's happening here, Frederico. Let me put things he, in the context. I, I, I was having all types of trauma, but that's oh my, my Texas. That's my first and last time being to Texas. Mm. See, but I'm going to Houston. I don't. In I don't. I, November, I have, so. I have no Texas stories. I've spent no, <laughs> I've spent, and, and it's, it's not a diss to Texas. I think Austin and Dallas and Houston, I, I, I'm sure they're very interesting places, but I, I've not had the reason to hang out in Texas, not yet. So, yeah. Well, I don't want to see no clan robes <clears throat> in, in the, in the <laughs> And I hate that that's my Texas thing because I know there's so much black culture in Houston and oh, totally. everywhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know. But um, we're supposed to be getting to this hip hop conversation. So I wanted, so I was, you know, I'm gonna be transparent. I was like, oh, it's Women's History Month. And I was like, ah, do I care? Yes, I do. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, 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 let me, uh, I was like, I was like, I gotta get Kim on here because she's always, you're always talking about hip hop on the morning show. And it's like, you always know the lyrics. You always know the producer. You always know the with the song, the rapper. I was like, she loves hip hop just as much as I do. So I just wanted to have a conversation about, you know, hip hop and culture. Cause like, you know, Dr. Jared Ball is always talking about how, you know, hip hop is not this radical thing for change. And then, but then Kalanji says it is, but then like, you know, so it's just, it would just have different, you know, views on here. I'm mm-hmm. wondering, like, in the land of culture, like, where do you see hip hop? Like, is it, mm-hmm. like, where is it for you, like, in your life? That's interesting that you say that. So I, I think I'd have to kind of start that from my entry point into hip hop, which would be, you know, sixth grade, sixth, seventh grade, 90, 91, 92, somewhere in there. Um, and I remember, I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Piper, because I have a feeling you you two hold uh, Dream Hampton in, in, in high esteem. Like, I remember 
getting that particular um episode it's not an episode jesus what they call the magazines child what vibe <laughs> no 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 it was the source but oh, it was okay. that month's whatever <clears throat> month's you know version it was of the source i can't remember who was on the cover was it Pac? was it dre and snoop i don't know but and i actually need to go to my mom's house and find all these old source and vibe magazines and ysb magazines because i had them right and that's and that's mm -hmm. all part of our own personal archives and us archiving the culture uh, from our perspective as well. But anyway, reading Dream Hampton um, talk about, I think, D Barnes um, getting assaulted mm -hmm. by Dr. Dre. And I remember being a teen girl, a very young teen girl, and just thinking like, wow, like girls are, are gonna have to fight in this culture, <laughs> you know, not not to be harmed. And and that mm. was kind of the, the, the sort of, bimodal way in which I thought about rap and hip hop. Like this is a culture that I feel a part of. I'm, I'm, I gravitate to it. I'm drawn to it. But at the same time, I see the exclusion of women or the pigeonholing of women or, you know, the, the marginalization of women, even as, as a teenager and I didn't have words for these things, you know what I mean? But I still could see what, what was happening. So I don't know if I consider uh, hip hop culture and rap music to be radical. I think rap, mu and I like to differentiate those things because one, mm -hmm. one of the things that really grinds my gears is when I hear like hip hop and rap used interchangeably. And I'm like, these are not the same things. <laughs> like, right. like rap is the genre, hip hop <clears throat> is the culture. And, and, and people say, oh, well, he's a hip hop rapper. Oh, shut the fuck up. No, he's a rapper. Mm -hmm. He's not a hip hop rapper. He's just a rapper. But anyway, um, j just, just knowing that, um, that that things are were unbalanced from from a gender perspective and just having an idea that even though this was a culture that I identified with and and loved um it wasn't necessarily a guarantee that it was going to love me but and but mm. i think the rap in itself rap as a genre i think was I don't know about revolutionary. I see. I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to overstep since I know we on BPM and words mean things. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want to be throwing words. This shit was it was the rebel revolutionary. No, it wasn't. It wasn't that. But it did. It was groundbreaking. We can say that, right? It was. It was landscape altering when it comes to music and the, the way that black people, um, and young black people were presented at that time. So I don't know if I would consider it radical. But it was, um, it, it did shift the, the music landscape in the 80s to the 90s. Because I also saw the ways in which rap music was um, kind of ostracized, even by our elders. Because, again, I grew up in a market where you didn't hear rap until after 6 p.m. Rap was day parted. You didn't hear rap music during the day or in the afternoon or in the 5 o'clock mix. Like, you didn't hear rap until the nighttime show and the mix show. Right. So, um, and I, I always thought that was weird. Like rap was always sort of trying to find its niche and trying to, you know, gain entree into the, the, the broader landscape. But then when that happened, <laughs> it, it, it kind of over happened. Right. And then, and then it, it was over overly commodified and, you know, the, the quality and di different things sort of happened to rap music um, after everybody else, uh, discovered it and it became global and mainstream, et cetera. Even right now, Piper, like I tell you, when I hear regular people like on regular ass local news and they'd be like, you know, um, it, they'll be describing an incident and they will describe it as beef <laughs> or that, you know, they, they will, they will use these terms that I know that we originated and to hear them come out of the mouths of, you know, sometimes non-black folks, sometimes, you know, much older or even much younger. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, do y'all know how much shit we used to get for speaking our language? And now everybody speaks the dumb language. You know, what's interesting as you talk about that. So <clears throat> <sighs> so <laughs> I, I remember, um, so like around nine, so like when I finished college in 94, I moved to uh, uh, New York City. Mm -hmm. And my initial move into New York City, I um, had a friend that was like security and in Zulu Nation. I know that's a curse word these days. But um, <laughs> and then he uh, called me and was like, hey, Pipe, because I was a photographer and I had like 
you know, my major was photography and I was, people knew me from doing a lot of photography, like around school and everything. Oh. And he was like, I'm, I'm, um, doing some work. Do you want to come, um, on tour with Snoop Dogg? And I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> cause that was like 94. Oh yeah. And so I packed all my stuff, moved to New York city. And the day I moved there, he's like, uh, the tour is canceled. <laughs> Not canceled, but it's like postponed. So I'm like, ah, so fast forward, I start um, going through the clubs and taking pictures, but then I wasn't really making money. So I started, I could sing a little bit. So I started singing background in the clubs to like make some money. And I, then I started meeting people in the hip hop industry, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, fast forward, it was a very separate world. Um, hip hop like the culture and the music industry. And a lot of the uh, rappers and DJs and producers and stuff, um, they didn't really have um, access to be in the music industry. Now mm -hmm. they were probably like selling their tapes, right? They we would go to West Forth basketball court and they were like selling their tapes there or they would be at the West Fork basketball courts or you know um in the park like you know rapping in the ciphers and this is like your most deafs and all these kind of people you know the backpackers and stuff mm -hmm. this before they're like you know so it's just interesting to be a part of this culture like from the like very like grassroots of it and just like see like that kind of I don't know is that an evolution anyway it's transformation. <laughs> and so, um, you know, doing the photography in that and being a woman, it was very difficult because number one, people saw being a photographer as a man's thing mm. and being a professional photographer, they saw as being a white man's thing. And so it was kind of like this kind of double thing, like, you know, going through that because I would, um, you know, I loved hip hop. It was like my thing. It was like my, my passion. But at the time, this sounds really weird in 2024, <laughs> but at the time there was no like career in that. Mm -hmm. So, so people were like, you know, hip hop was still seen as like, um, a joke in a way. Cause hmm. there was like the people who had kind of made it and they were like, seen in a certain way but if they didn't have like a record deal if they were like still rapping in a cypher if they were in that they were seen as like you know losers i don't know another way to put it so there was this kind of like cultural difference between those worlds and so i remember when people started being able to like make more um entree i'll say into like that music industry world and i guess that was where you got a lot of these other types of labels where you've got like your raucous and mm -hmm. you know these these you know so they're kind of finding even though those are still white boys they're finding a way to like not be a major and like you know find an audience and and get these guys on tour but they're still not making like the money mm -hmm. they're still not making like a living per se um and at that time you also had this magazine culture and the magazine culture is like chronicling this. So you've got these kind of mainstream magazines. They weren't mainstream at the time. So like the source used to be underground. Yes. It became mainstream, but it used That's to right. be like a very underground thing. The vibe used to be a very niche underground, yes. underground mm -hmm. thing when Quincy Jones first came out. Um, that's when Dream used to do that's things right. for it. That's right. She did. And the there was like a separation though, right? And mm -hmm. it was like. And so the world that I was in, I was trying to do fashion photography, which was very white. Mm. And I was like the only black woman that was over there doing that stuff, right? <sighs> and the hip hop stuff was like white boys. So all the white boys were like doing all the photography and stuff over there. And then you had the black guys that were like trying to be in both worlds and like not being taken seriously because these magazines and things felt that these white boys were like better at like chronically in the culture. And there was this whole sort of 
other culture that I'm gonna call it of white people, which is white boys and white chicks or whatever. And they were considered like the curators of the culture. Mm. So everybody was looking to them to understand like what was hot, what was this, what was that? So they were kind of dictating mm. the culture at that time. And it was really annoying because all these magazines were really like looking to them to be leaders. And I just remember like myself and other, you know, black photographers being like, what is going on? Like they didn't want to pay us. They didn't want to hire mm. us. They didn't want us to film or photograph things. And it was like, and so from there, a lot of the rappers, when they started making it, they start hiring those same people. So it's a really interesting paradigm to see like how, when we talk about culture and, you know, what shapes culture, because like the people who chronicle the culture also help, you know, Jared Ball always talks about that, your taste, <laughs> like they are shaping your taste. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Your appetite, you know, what you like, you know, this kind of thing. So as you talk about that, I just remember being in that process and that uncomfortability and that anger mm. that I felt around all of that, um, which is why I always tried to shoot for like these sort of interesting other magazines, which is why I never made so much money. But <laughs> but I was always trying to be like, no, this is our culture. This is who we are. This, you know, so anyway, I went on a tangent, but you just made me think about that. That One whole of my thing. favorite um, from that era, it was a magazine called Blaze. And I remember, at least I still hope I still have it at my mama's house, but Redman had done the cover and the inside, the, the feature layout, um, the photo spread of him was him um, skydiving. So whoever was a photographer had jumped out the plane with Red <laughs> and Red is giving middle fingers to the camera and he's in the sky. Like, I mean, it's it's, it's those kinds of things that, that I remember specifically of that era. But I, I guess because I was of an age and in the region where, you know, the most of the, the hip hop culture wasn't being created, like we were consuming it in, in D.C. Uh, and there was a lot of competition between rap and go-go. Well, maybe some some might argue there was actually not that much competition between rap and go-go. I can tell you a story real quick here, Piper Carter. So 96, Howard Homecoming at the D.C. Armory, it was um, a, a, a constellation of rap and go-go artists uh, performing at the Armory. You know what an Armory is, right? So it's of not, course. not yeah. close to Howard's campus, right? Yeah. Like not even in the same quadrant as HU campus. It's a, it was in Washington, right? It's in the district. <laughs> it's a, it was the, what DC DMV. Where would y'all say uh, the Armory is? What's that? Deanwood? What's that? Bennett Road? I mean, anyway, Northeast, right? And so at the end of the show, it's 15 minutes left in the show, right? And Wu Tang has not performed. Wu Tang is on the bill, and Junkyard Band has not performed. So the MC, whoever was the host, came out was like, "Listen, y'all." We got 15 minutes that they're going to put us up out of here. So it's up to y'all. Y'all want to see Wu-Tang or y'all want to see Junkyard Bam? <laughs> when I tell you, Piper Carter, the way the people said, oh, J-Y, like it wasn't even close, Piper. It wasn't even close. And this was 96. This is, this is, this is 96 Wu-Tang. This is everybody got their first solo albums out Wu-Tang. This is before Wu-Tang forever. This was, this was the Wu when Wu was dead on top no question and dc had no interest <laughs> it's like if you don't bring out the junkyard band and tell them woo niggas to go to go to that other howard university homecoming after party like it was just something i mean and it, it, i don't even know if that would happen today you know what i'm saying because i i just i don't know like that that was something that i, I would never forget like dc made it very clear like as much you know we would respect you know rap especially some artists like the woo but that shit don't get no play next to go-go music in this town you know no I mean? y'all love the go-go <laughs> and what is the name what's the name of the baltimore music baltimore club or baltimore, baltimore club okay mm -hmm. yeah because y'all that baltimore club music is different than then Detroit like, house. Definitely. Detroit yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 
<laughs> no one in Detroit. Like so many people, you know, I didn't know that Detroit cre black people in Detroit created electronica music. You know what I mean? C created yeah. uh, drum and bass music. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. there's a lot there that Detroit has given to the to the to the culture. You know, techno is interesting um cuz we got to credit Chicago Creative House. Mm -hmm. And New York had its own club music, like the Gwen mm -hmm. Guthrie, kind of Colonel Abrams kind of thing going on. And Detroit had techno, which is like a very, like it's, it's, it's a driving, really, you know, um, electronic sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the, the techno evolution, you know, is born out of this culture of like the, the people who are the children. Well, and also the people who make the cars, mm. right? So the mm -hmm. work. So so Detroit was a very like auto centric town. So the majority of the people are working class, are in the union, are um, you know working on the line and the plant. And so um, you know they work this to twelve to fifteen hours, sometimes twenty hour shifts, and then it's like doing the music, they got to figure out like when and how they're going to do their music. And so there's a lot of like correlation between like that sound and like their life. You know what I mean? Like wow. doing tinkering and working with machinery and. Oh, I can yeah. see. Okay, I get it now. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The repetitive sound. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Yeah. The, like the clunk and. Mm -hmm. Okay, well then let's 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 tempo that up a little bit and see what yeah. that sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that. that's kind of where the culture. Yes, techno is from Detroit, Big Tia. Uh, shouts out to all the folks, mm -hmm. Kevin Saunderson and everyone that created um, mm -hmm. techno. So yeah, no, but, literally uh, every yeah. genre of music created in this rotten colony, niggas did that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> like, Pick, pick a shot. Like, people don't even know. Like, no, they're like, no, the bad people did this dance. We did. Yes, yes, absolutely. We did. Did we invent country and bluegrass and you know, techno and all? Yes, all of the things. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Every single type of sonic. <laughs> everything. <laughs> everything. Everything. So, you know what's interesting? Um, when it comes to like these conversations about like women in hip hop, you know, I think they get very narrowly squeezed, squozen mm. <laughs> into like this, like, how come those girls are twerking? But um, I think like, you know, women have been all like throughout hip hop, like this whole time mm -hmm. as managers, as booking agents as record producers. label owners as mm -hmm. dancers as producers as djs as there's just this like all the things right fashion you know like you said magazines you know this whole thing i think the invisibilization of women or is it the erasure mm -hmm. yep. right of the ways in which women have actually shaped this culture mm -hmm. and it's interesting because I always talk about this, how, but like, I don't know how to put it in words, but th because there have been women who have had, I'm mean, going to use the word power mm -hmm. in this industry. I'm thinking of like your Sylvia Rones and mm -hmm. people that decision makers, green lighters, right? Right. It's, it's, it's an interesting phenomena paradigm that the women would be erased, you know what I mean? Like from um, the visibility of, of, of women, right? Because it's like women got reduced to like video vixens, um, maybe a rapper or two, the occasional DJ. Um, and then like Missy gets to be an anomaly as a music producer. But we know... There's all, there's so many different, there's so many women making music that have produced music over time, mm -hmm. right? There, I guess I'm just, I mean, what do you think about that? Like women that are in power, I mean, you can't speak for them. 
I'm just wondering like your thoughts around that, like, like, like having that type of a position, but then making the choices to like allow either some of this stuff to go or green lighting it, financing it, pushing it. Like what are, what do you have thoughts about that? Kinda. I mean, it's sort of the, like, I'm, I'm, I'm the special one. You know what I mean? So there can only be one or there can only be two, just like these, you know, wayward ass con black conservatives, right? Like, <laughs> Like, like they'd be so happy, you know. It, it'd just be the one or the two. It'd be Tim Scott and and and, and Byron Douglas, and then you know, the, the, then that's it. We've met our Negro quotient, you know, our, our our Negro quota. It's it's kind of the same thing. Like some some women, I think, who have power, um, you know, they want to see themselves as like the the special one. I'm the one who can be in the boys' club, um, mm. and and we see this so much where where people will achieve it's like marginalized folks women black folks you know latinas gay folks like some of them will, will attain a certain status but pu pull the ladder up behind them right like they they're not the ones trying to open the door and create more opportunities for more people like them um they they want to be the, the the one special one like i'm i'm the one strong powerful black woman who 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 could you know ha have the 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 might the might to endure you know the rigors of this industry it's just mm. me <laughs> you know what I'm saying like, like ain't nobody else do this but me so and and so the, they will take strides you know and and make moves to to keep it that way I mean sometimes mm. the the biggest enemy of women in this industry have been other women right like yes uh, it hasn't happened often. Uh, but the one or two times it has happened, like it, it's, it stayed with me. Right. I'm, I'm not, I, I was not used to being undercut or undermined or backstabbed by black women. And, it, but when it happened, like I was shocked, <laughs> like, mm. I, I was taken aback. I said, but sister, <laughs> I thought we were sisters. No, no, mm. no, we are not sisters out this bitch no i mean it and so i mean there, there's something to that there's a book called w women's inhumanity to women right and it talks mm. about the ways in which you know women internalize misogyny and then the ways that we put that out right like we we undercut each other we backbite each other uh we we can talk about or degrade each other's looks or you know gossip about body counts or you know other other trivial mm -hmm. things but in ways that in endear women in the eyes of men right like mm. it, it, does that am i for you following me here i'm making sense? it reminds me not to throw shade but it just <laughs> reminds me of like <sighs> forgive me I, like angela yee's um show <laughs> you know like i think a lot of i have you ever watched it never not once beloved. so but a lot of times well she's got two shows and i love angela yee and i know her but like I, like sometimes I really, I feel like, man, you got such a big platform. Like I wish you would talk about other stuff, but I feel that's like a lot has, of, that's why she has a big platform though, baby. Cause she don't talk about shit. Right. Like, I mean, I mean, that, that, that that's the thing we have to, we have to <laughs> like, we have to acknowledge that. Right. Mm. Like it's not even so, I'm sorry. My dog just walked in the room. So my apologies. No, that's fine. Hey doggy. <laughs> <laughs> you might come back in here, but I mean, over the years, Piper, you know what I'm saying? I, I was in the same class, let's say, with some folks that are very, very big and very visible now. And I see them and I see the things that they talk about and I see the things that they don't talk about. And I understand why they are where they are and I am where I am. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because there's just certain things. If, if you're not going for certain things, th then you ain't going. <laughs> you know what I mean? Can you like, talk about that? Because like. Being a woman in radio or a black woman in radio, because like, can you talk about your radio like experience of like, you know, where were you like, okay, I'm gonna have this goal like in you know in radio, and then it and then it turned to something else, or did you follow like your path and you're like, that's exactly what I want to do is exactly the way it came out. No, the quite the opposite. Like I, well, to be clear, radio was like my fallback. What I wanted to do was be a sportscaster. Like I was, I really wanted to work at ESPN. Like I really wanted to be a sports anchor. I really wanted to be the woman, Stuart Scott. Like I really had a thing for sports and politics simultaneously. Like as a teen, 
um, you know, I remember in the mornings at before school, <laughs> waking up and watching the, the early sports center, you know, this whatever sports center came on at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. Watch Sports Center, go to school, you know, come back home after practice and work and watch the news. I was always like a news hound, a news consumer. And on Sundays, I'd always watch Meet the Press and uh, the McLaughlin Group and other the, the other Sunday, um, some of the other Sunday political shows that came on. So when I got into radio, it was kind of by accident because I just I needed an internship that summer. It was my first semester. I just finished up my first semester at Temple. January of 99. And because, you know, when you're young, you, you, you have this, um, these deadlines in your head that you have sort of self-imposed and maybe society has imposed them upon you a little bit. So I was quote a year behind, right? I had dropped out of college for a year. So I was trying to quote, catch up, right? Like a goof. So my point is, so I, after my first semester at Temple, January 99, I stayed at Temple for the whole summer because I took both summer sessions because I was trying to get some credits up. And so I want, I needed an internship and that's where I got the internship at the radio station and they let me talk. And if it turns out, <laughs> the, the, the shorty can talk on the radio. And so that opened up just like the fun part of it for me, the the meeting the artists, the hanging out with the artists. Like that first summer, like I met Slick Rick. I met Guru. I met DJ Premier. Like I saw Primo mix, cut and scratch and do all his edits wow. live on the radio. Conversely, Piper, this was the same year uh, Beanie Siegel came up to the radio station that I was interning at smack the dj while i was there wow <laughs> i saw like it was crazy shit i was like oh my god this shit is wild so i'm thinking yeah this is going to be cool but then i had i had competing interests i was trying to figure out was i going to finish school was i not going to finish school so i ended up not staying at that radio station i did end up finishing school and then i started came down to dc and started to work there but what i realized was you know when you're when you're young and, and a black woman, um, you're not taken very seriously, even though it, at that particular time, like I was firmly in the demographic, like the radio stations that I was working at the time, their demo was 18 to 34. I'm 22. You know what I mean? 23. I'm like, y'all, I know what's going on here. I know what the streets are talking about. <clears throat> and I would bring these ideas and they would get shot down or ignored. But then in a roundabout way, I would end up being proven right. And it, I found it to be like very frustrating because it's like, well, you know, wh why, why should I continue to bring my ideas if either they're not going to get listened to or they're going to get stolen or they're going to get brushed aside or even worse, the competition comes up with the same idea and I'd be looking at my, like people at my joint, like I told y'all niggas, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, very quickly, I realized that that was going to be a pattern of me banging my head up against the wall. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Trying trying to prove myself to people that were determined not to listen to me anyway, because for whatever reason, you know what I mean? They had already established in their to themselves that, you know, either I, I didn't know or I was too young or you was too girl or wh whatever reason. And, and that frustrated me because I always... I always saw myself as equal to men and boys. I never felt as though any boy or any man knew more than me or could say more to me. But I, I, I was aware, even though I didn't have words for it at the time, I wish I would have studied done gender studies in college. Cause I probably would have had a, a lot more understanding, but in the ways in which men uh, microaggress over you, like when they talk over you, when they start, to, when you're talking and then they start talking and they start talking louder, like to drown you out. And then you realize that, oh, well, that's not just something that this guy does. A lot of these fucking guys do this shit. And then in, 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 in the ways that the, the gender expectations that you are there to be, to look a certain way, to come off a certain way, um, you know, to not be too overly aggressive, like it, 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 like these things, these messages, even if they weren't being said to me explicitly, these are things that I was, these are messages that I was receiving and I resented, I, I really had a lot of re resentment towards that. And plus the pay disparity, um, was, was obvious. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there was instances, especially early on in my career 
where I couldn't even negotiate a salary, right? Like I would be handed contracts and, you know, okay, I'll take a look over this and then I'll bring it back. I'm like, can we change this? And it'd be like, no. <laughs> I'd be like, okay, well, can I get more money here? Mm -mm, no. Like, I mean, there was at least three or four, maybe five jobs in which I could negotiate my salary because they would, they would just tell me that this is it. You can take it or leave it. So it's like, well, either accept this degraded pay, which it is, or not be employed. You know what I mean? So am, am I, I feel like I'm rambling, Pat. <laughs> like, no, I mean, it's, it's a, such a great learn, like learning about your path you know, and your journey. Cause I, well, there's a question in the chat, but before I ask you that one question, I went to, so how'd you become burn it down? Like, when did you become the burn it down Kim Brown? Or were you, well, maybe you were always that burn it down, but when did you like live yeah. into it? Okay. So can I tell you a couple stories? I'm going to be quick. Yeah. Okay. And again, it, it, I, I, I appreciate you, you kind of ask, and then this is a good opportunity for me to say this. So saying what I said about I, I never saw myself as lesser to man or lesser to white, right? Like I'm better. <laughs> okay. It's like, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I, I am. So um, that fearlessness came out in a couple of ways. Um, and I realized that I was going to have problems in this industry <laughs> because, because you're not supposed to be this way in Philly. After the life and times of S, S Carter volume three came out, Jay-Z came to power 99 and uh, I, again, I wasn't a full-time personality at all. I was Co uh, Kobe Cole's little sidekick. It was my turn to ask Jay-Z a question. Kobe was, I was surprised I was even in there getting to ask Jay-Z questions, right? So do you remember the song, Do It Again? 3 a.m. on the way to the oh, club, yeah. uh -huh. 4 a.m. So are you familiar with the Rare Essence song, the Go-Go song? Four in the morning, the pancake house. Come on. No, but I know they have at least a song for every song. <laughs> okay. 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 So, so different than some go-go songs. Um, the overnight scenario was a song by rare essence, a go-go band. It's an original song. <laughs> it, it's not a cover song. It's an original song. And it talks about, you know, four in the morning, the pancake house, 3 AM. We roll into my house. And it has a lot of, uh, similarities as Jay Z's do it again. And everybody mm. in DC knew this, okay? Okay. So in Philly, so now here Jay is in Philly. I'm from DC. Kobe's there. It's Kim, ask you a question for Jay Z. So Jay, um, so you know that that rare essence song that you bit the Do It Again, girl. <laughs> I, tell you, I, I wish I could convey to y'all the look on this nigga's face. I wish y'all could see the way Jay Z looked at me. <laughs> To him. I said, Jay, you know that song you bit from Rare Essence? Who shit. And but but see, Piper, that's me, right? Like, of course he bit the song. This nigga knew he bit the song. What was I supposed of to course. say? I mean, the whole DMV probably knew. Everybody knew it. Everybody right. knew it. But mm -hmm. but just to give you a little bit of where I was from. And then the next time that I got to interview Jay-Z on my own in, in 01. Again, I had to ask him a question. I asked him a lot nicer this time, but it was a question nonetheless. So in the song H to the Izzo, Jay-Z said, I was herbing him in the home of the Turpins, right? Mm -hmm. Got it dirt cheap for them. Got it something, something, put in that work for them. So I asked him, you know, when you, what, can you explain what you meant by I was herbing them in the home of the Turpins? You, it's the University of Maryland, Terp, Terps, the Turpins. Of course he was talking about Maryland. So I had to get him to say, no, I was. I used to hustle out in Cambridge, which is Eastern Shore, which is a bridge right away, which is nowhere near Baltimore, which is nowhere near Prince George's County, which is nowhere near Montgomery County, where, where the niggas live, right? This nigga talk about he was he was getting it in Cambridge. Okay, that's cool, but let's be clear about where you was and where you was not herbing them in the home of the Turpins. You understand? So, so that doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't always work Piper like you know I'm supposed to know my place out here I can't be asking you can't you can't, you can't be asking Jay-Z no questions about you know what he meant in his shit so anyway so this is why I, I kind of realized some somewhere early on that I was going to have some problems because I, I'm I wasn't willing to a not be myself I can say this now uh Russ Parr of the Russ Parr morning show Russ Parr told me years ago like he said you know 
you're you're too much yourself. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Girl, and that's and that when he said that, I I I knew again, it was all these red flags flapping in the wind. I'm like, I don't know if this is gonna be for me because I'm being told literally <laughs> that that who I am as a person is not it, it is not compatible with this industry, right? Because I'm not willing to 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 be subservient. Like I don't even like the idea of being a sidekick or a co-host to a man. You understand? Like mm -hmm. because I look at the ways in which well, it's a little different now, but urban radio is very gendered. Usually morning mm -hmm. shows are led by men. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. With the, with the man in the front. The, the chick the on the front. side. <laughs> gossip girl. Okay, it's time for random bitch with the random bitch gossip. Girl, what yeah. the gossip is. You yeah. know, I'm not, that's not me. <laughs> that's not who I am. So anyway. So anyway, so present day, Piper, when I see certain people who have been in this, you know, this broadcasting lane, black broadcasting lane for about the same amount of years I have, I see what they talk about and I see what they don't talk about. I see the positions that they take and, and I see the positions that they don't take. And I understand why they are where they are and I am where I am because I don't even see me anywhere up there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't see the, the, the equivalent. I don't see the Kim Brown that actually I don't either. It. No, no, you, don't. <laughs> you don't you do not mm -mm. well you know what and let me say this thank you so much for living into who you actually are because that's what made me become a fan because when I saw you I was like oh my god like that's me like that's my radio host like you're the radio host I've always been like looking for like I would love for you to bring me my hip hop or my R and B or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I don't listen to sports, but uh, <laughs> okay, okay. but I but maybe you could do sports on Black Power Media. <laughs> the rumor was that a certain cutie by the name of Hiram was supposed to be doing a sports show, but don't don't get don't give me a line, girl, because I don't know, but. I, but I, I don't know, girl. I don't know what that. Listen, it, it, I'm I'm down for the sports. I, I've I've always, but but but, but I I watch sports. All admittedly, Piper for you know nefarious reasons. Like <laughs> men like, <laughs> like sports, okay. <laughs> And and be a, chick, be a chick in 2000 and be able to talk basketball or football with these niggas. These niggas was dropping their drawers like this, girl. Right. That's hilarious. <laughs> Ooh. Well, <Sorry>. you know, <laughs> but I I really I'm gonna tell you something. I love what you bring Thank to you. you know this space. Like for me, I I want like I'm a fan. Like I watch you see me in the chat. I watch the uh I watch the morning I watch the morning show because I'm like oh finally there's a rate there's a morning radio for like for me. You know I like it feels like it feels like y'all when I found it I was like so happy because I was like this is what I've always been looking for because I'm tired of like the I mean, I like goofiness. Like, I don't want to say I don't like goofiness, but it's like, I don't know, just useless. Um, say I it. don't know how to Come put on, it. Say it, girl. No, listen, it's it's ridiculousness on urban yeah. radio, right? And don't get me wrong. Yeah. This is why I love the Remix Morning Show, too, because, again, we, we do not abandon goofiness and silliness, right? Yeah, <laughs> you guys have fun, right? Have fun in the morning. You yeah. know? But like, I'm not the one and I appreciate, you know, none of my comrades either, you know, oh my goodness, why did this rapper, you know, buy his mother a 35,000 Hermes back? It's like, who the fuck cares about yeah. all this? You know, the, the hyper materialism and consumerism and the, in the, the, the jocking of, you know, yo, you know, so-and-so just bought him a new Bugatti or a new da -da -da. And it's like, yeah. why do y'all, can, can y'all get off the Europeans' dicks for they cars? Yeah, they don't like go? you. Please. You know what I'm saying? So, again, another ways in which I was incongruent with urban radio, because again, I, I, I'm not into the materialistic culture. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right, like it's, right. it's cool to like nice things, but you want to tell everybody that I don't know much of Versace and the Gucci and the, and the, and the yeah. and like, that, I, nobody care. But the but way anyway. that y'all bring the news too is refreshing because you know, if you watch a lot of these other channels i mm -hmm. mean they're not really um giving you a perspective that is like from the side of like the people 
-hmm. right? It's like this perspective that's on the side of the corporations. Mm -hmm. So whether it's like corporations perspective light, <laughs> liberalism light, mm -hmm. or like, you know, this kind of, I don't know, it's really disgusting, honestly. So I, I feel like when, when y'all are bringing us the news, like even if y'all disagree, right? Mm -hmm. It's still from the perspective like of the people, right? Which yeah. is fine. There's fine to be like disagreement, mm -hmm. right? Or Absolutely. on the left or whatever. But I just, I just appreciate that the perspective that y'all are bringing is like, okay, life affirming, you know, uh, pro-black, <laughs> you know, um, just this perspective that's like, you know, um, let's dig deeper, you know, let's dig deeper into like, you know, what's going on. Let's try to really understand these dynamics. Like how, you know, what does this have to do with, you know, um, everyday people's lives. And I think that that is really important mm -hmm. because when, when we see like a so-called show that's supposed to be like for us, like a breakfast club, they give us like Charlemagne. <laughs> yes. Who is disgusting. Yes. And he hates women. And I don't care what he says. Oh, it's obvious. <laughs> Girl, and you, not, you may not even remember the first one of the first ways I can remember. So be clear. I've never met Charlemagne to my memory. I don't think we've ever met or we're not acquainted or none of that. But I remember when he was on the radio in South Carolina. And I remember the, one of the things that he first made news for was he had like kind of a, a very derogatory interview with Buffy the body. Do you remember Buffy the body? I do. She, yeah, for those of a certain y'all babies that we going, we got some babies in the chat. Buffy and the mm -hmm. body was like one of the first like video vixens of let's say the late nineties. I, I wouldn't say the first, but she was very well known. Like she made a name for herself. Like, and she was named Buffy the body for a reason. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and I remember Charlemagne had interviewed her, but he was, I mean, it was just mad disrespectful. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. asking her, you know, about sexual partners and disease, I mean, abortions. And it's like, the fuck is wrong with you, man? Like, do you ask these niggas these fucking questions? Like, do do you ask these niggas about their body no. counts and abortions that they pay for? Like, it's just it it it's th so I knew this dog. I knew this person was on misogynistic time from from way way back. And remember so his remember his whole first decade <laughs> was like being mean to women. Yes. Like every woman he talked to, he was so mean and except disgusting. Wendy. Except Wendy, except Wendy, because remember Wendy. when Charlamagne yeah. was it was her was her sidekick, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> he brought the gossip. <laughs> do you remember that? Kind of, yes, I do. She I would do. always ask Charlemagne the tea. He always had the tea. Cause and because I remember he wasn't really on the mic. Well, this was in New York. Mm -hmm. So on New York radio, when, when she had her show and he was her sidekick, um, she would talk to him, but he wasn't really like on the air so much. He might come on every now and then, but I don't know if he was maybe doing production, you know, I don't know, but she would talk about him. Like she would say his name a lot, but mm -hmm. we wouldn't really hear from him too much, but she would always ask him to like confirm the tea. And she'd be like, remember we went there and we saw this and that. And she would have all this gossip. He'd be like, Yeah. So I was like, wow, because like, so how do I remember seeing that not on his head for so long? Was it didn't she have her show on VH1 or something like I could remember? I think it was after because I feel I'm to think the timeline is he was weird. cackling on her show and he had this, <laughs> he had his big friend on his head. It joke with like <laughs> 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 y'all. You remember that episode of Family Guy when uh Chris had the pimple and the pimple <laughs> not was doing was yelling at that nigga from his forehead <laughs> yeah i don't know but i mean so like for instance sorry, right sorry, so like the 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 landscape right of mm -hmm. media so the breakfast club then to take it back to our original conversation mm -hmm. gets to be positioned or the joe button show that has <laughs> melissa ford on the side <laughs> but like all these i mean all these different or even like drink champs which has <sighs> uh, the only women I see is like serving a drink. But, mm -hmm. That's where the uh, bitches belong, Piper. You didn't know that? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, but these shows are positioned within mm -hmm. so called like the urban landscape. But then if you go to like, let's say, like, I don't know, the other side, 
then it's like these shows like Angela Yee's show, mm -hmm. which is all about serving men. <laughs> but it's under this idea of like women's empowerment oh, and entrepreneurship. <laughs> I don't, it's really weird. And it's like, I just don't see that when I saw y'all's show, the morning show, I'm telling you, I was like, that is, that's what I needed. I needed some, I needed my news to have some jokes in it. And it's black needed. people from a black perspective, from an internationalist, pro-black, pan-Africanist, leftist perspective. That's what I'm talking about. Because all these other shows, I was like, I feel like I'm in a weird Willy Wonka world. And I'm like, what is... But think of the people who that's their diet. <gasps> that's yeah. their media diet. No, that, that's, that's terrifying. Like, I, I, that, that's something that, that bothers me. <laughs> and I hope, <laughs> I, hope, I hope that the viewers of Angela Yee show and the breakfast club, I hope they go to TikTok and get their proper news. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like, like regular Gen Z people, but I know, but first of all, thank you so much for saying that Piper. That is such a, that such a generous compliment. And I appreciate that because what the remix does is what I have always, and this to be clear, the remix is not my vision. This was, this was, you know, J Jared put all this together, but even still, like it, it still represents a vision that I always had for a black radio, a black urban morning show. Like you can give the people the, the sugar with the medicine. Like, yes, you can crack jokes. Yes, you can uh, be a little off the wall and be ridiculous and crack on each other. And But you can still also bring the people the important and imp pertinent information that they need. And it, and it really breaks my heart um, to know that black radio doesn't really serve that purpose anymore. And I know it used to. And I know in a city like Detroit, I know it did. And, and I think in, in some forms it still does. Like that black talk, um, radio aspect, and even when it was urban, I, I mean, what do I mean? I mean, like music, music formatted, music intensive stations, like a morning show where you have a little bit more space to do talking. Like you could, you know, bring up these topics. You could bring in people from the community. You can talk about the violence that's happened in the communities. Like there, there were ways to do this, but the problem is when you syndicate shows across the country when you don't have a local voice and local flavor there anymore where you have a Ricky Smiley or Russ Parr or Steve Harvey and they're trying to sound like they're everywhere but nowhere at the same time like I I really hate the lack of uh localization I hate yeah. syndication um you know in in the ways that syndication takes has stolen jobs by the thousands and millions probably but stolen jobs and it, it the, the fact that not every major city has a local morning show, like that's heartbreaking to somebody like me who grew up on local radio. Like I love- And the culture, the it ruins one. the culture. It totally ruins the culture. But then look who's being entrusted with these day parts. Ricky Smiley, Steve fucking Harvey. Are you kidding me? Like, we're not talking about the, 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 the brightest bulbs or the sharpest pencils in the box here. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about- Comedians, and I'm not saying comedians don't have something to contribute, but I don't think they should be leading the morning show. <laughs> you know what I'm saying that just that just me. Yeah. So so um I don't know. Like, and, and and uninformed, right? Oh, like, that and you know, telling <laughs> giving the shit from the from the Hollywood capitalistic perspective. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, reinforcing you know punishment when, when people step out of bounds. I'm trying to even think of an example when so, a celebrity fucked up and did something good and they got criticism for it. But I can't. I, mm -hmm. I'm losing it. But you understand what I'm saying? Like, um, yeah. like misdirecting criticism in the wrong places, or you know, ho holding up the likes of Obama or Colin Powell. Like, I was so disappointed when I heard Donnie Simpson, like, lamenting about Colin. Like, you know, we lost a good brother. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, who, wait, first of all, Donnie, who is we? <laughs> and who is the good brother? Colin Powell? That you know, he's from Detroit. Yes, a girl, Donnie, Donnie Simpson. Simpson will tell everybody in D.C. he's from Detroit. Yes, Don, we, we know Donnie from Detroit. He tells us, he know he don't ever shit on Detroit. Never. <laughs> <laughs> never, not never. <laughs> Did Donnie, because he just retired or whatever, you know, did, did, had his last hurrah uh, as live local afternoons. You know, he said that he was on the radio in Detroit when he was a kid, when he was a teenager. Mm, I think so. Yeah. You know, Detroit, 
Um, and I'm gonna get to your question, Latif. <laughs> but Detroit, <laughs> I just gotta say this: hat um has the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first black owned uh radio station, WGPR. Really? Yeah, and so um they have a museum here for it. Uh, we used to have our own TV show that was like it was called The Scene. And it was like a soul train, but it was local, mm, but it was mm -hmm. like, so way back in the day before he was famous, like Prince was on there. So it broke a lot of acts. Mm, so wow. that's how like they broke Prince and they broke, you know, they had Rick James, like they had all these different mm. people on the show. And um, I never knew that Nat Morris, shouts out to Nat Morris. Um, he was like a pioneer in this kind of uh host like video mm. uh, DJ well he it was like he was a video personality that mm. introduced the artists but it was live and then in the studio you had the dance acts and then and there was like a soul train line and they would go down the soul train line I'm gonna send you some videos but they would they would go down the soul train line they do all these Detroit dances and stuff and then he would like interview the artist so it was pretty much just like soul train but then uh, I guess later they started really getting into like breaking artists because the show got wow. like so popular that like if you went on the show, then people, you know, would like buy your album and, mm -hmm. you know, all this kind of thing. And so um, that was like a, a earlier iteration, I guess. But 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 then somewhere mm, towards like the early, like around, I guess, like 80 two-ish is when we started getting into like music videos mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so there was like you know sometimes they would show like these interesting but back then music videos were like art you know they were kind mm -hmm. of just like interesting they didn't they weren't like i mean they're art but they were like sort of these interesting things that may or may not have gone with the song yes uh, yes yeah yeah so that was like a but i'm gonna get to the teeps question so thank you for the five dollar is thank that a super you. chat at the green thank is the super you. chat i think yes okay or whatever and, color right yeah so he says uh what are your takes on the direction and longevity of hip hop from today's standpoint and um, radio play to unsigned to social media popular. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I think maybe he means in uh, instead of new artists being broken or being beholden to getting their songs played on the radio, the ways in which social media is breaking new artists, even those that don't uh, you know, have a label home or, you know what I mean? Like what, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I think I'm understanding you, Latif, if you could, uh, you know, cl cl clarify. Um, mm -hmm. but what did the first part of the question start out with? I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I figured that um, let me go back up a little bit. It was, uh, man, there's a lot of chats. Hey, what's so up, chat? <laughs> the chat is in here. Chatty, chat, chatty. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Wait, I'm going up. back up. Man, I'm going way back up here. Where did it go? When did it disappear? It I kind of lost it somewhere. It was like, um, where is that chat? Ah. Where do I think okay. that? Uh, well, here's the thing. Oh, I found it. Oh, okay. Lord, this man wrote a paragraph. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, wrote, wrote a paragraph of questions. Okay, hold on. Let me let me let me figure this out. Um, so the, Piper, uh, this is why I part. I, I really appreciate the work that you do because um, I appreciate you breaking down uh, the Nicki Minaj, Megan Thee Stallion beef because, quite honestly, I I lack the energy. Right? Like I can't. <laughs> 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 I do. I really lack the energy. And, you know, I, I I appreciate you noticing that I yes, I do love rap. I do love hip hop. Um, but I'm understanding now that I love it from a certain period and that I don't currently love it in its in its current iteration. And that even that is a bad take on my behalf because I know that there are quality artists out there that I'm just being too lazy to go look for. I understand that, right? And that's th these are part of my shortcomings. I get that. And that's you could people can critique me that and that's fine. That's fine. But this is what happens when you get 
middle age, everybody. You get you you might get a little stuck in your ways. Uh, you might just you know really prefer to listen to the music of your era, and that's kind of what I do. So I kind of feel like I'm a griot of that period. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I, a, a, a griot of of black. Me I, well, I want to be a griot of 20th century black music overall because. The, the way I'm studying black R and B of the fifties and forties, you know, it's like, God damn, like y'all don't even understand the depth of the talent that these folks had and what they were able to create with what they were working with. And under the conditions <laughs> of which they created it, like the brilliance of black people in the 20th century for our music was just, it, it still continues to blow my mind. But as it, as it pertains to rap, like once we got, like I missed all of Drake. I missed all of Nicki Minaj. <laughs> uh, I, I have missed all of Meek Mill. You know, I listened to one Megan The Stallion album and I liked it. I said, "Oh, Megan's cute." I said, "If I was twenty five, Megan The Stallion would be my favorite rapper because I love the way she talks shit." And um, but her shit talking differs than Kim's or Fo even Foxy's shit talking because I like the way Megan um she she'll make references to things like. Uh, what's one of the joints that she talks about? She was like, "Nigga, you you want to play mind games, nigga? That's for that's for needy bitches. You you call yourself not talking to me, nigga? I'm already calling my other nigga. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and and it, it, I'm like, I like that kind of shit talking, Megan. I said, yes, I said, girl, but yes. So anyway, so I appreciate you still tuning in, <laughs> you know, to kind of keep an eye on the culture because like. I'm I'm like, I can't like I just I'm, I'm a little there's so over much it. music. You know what I've been listening to as well? So this is the thing. Like what I well, I think the internet um allows us, well, in its iteration, hopefully it stays free, but <laughs> the internet allows us to have access to a lot of different stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm looking at stuff that my like because I work with youth and I'm mm -hmm. like what are y'all looking at and some of the stuff they're looking at I'm like oh I'm clutching my pearls <laughs> but some of the stuff I'm like oh that's kind of cool and so I think I really like music production mm. like I recognize that when I I sat I had a little talk with myself I was like you know what I feel that my thing like I love the era of like albums and vinyl mm -hmm. and so that was my thing growing up I would always like open up the vinyl because I always got uh records for like my birthday Christmas Kwanzaa really? I always got a they always bought me albums right so I would always have the album or somebody in my house always had the albums so mm -hmm. you open up the albums when you put on the record and it's like you listen your experience with it is through this artwork reading mm -hmm. who did the production and and by my parents like i told you they were part of the black arts movement mm -hmm. they would tell me like do you know who produced that and who wrote that and who played on that and it was always like a connection to like duke ellington or mm -hmm. dizzy gillespie or like mm -hmm. quincy jones or like you know anyway there were all these connections to these great music you know, writers and conductors and, you know, um, musicians. And just, I really was into like the musicality and like just different sonic mm. soundscapes. And I really loved funk and I really loved like all the interesting stuff about the funk records. And, you know, I would just get into the sound of it. And so when the music video eras started to come in, I think, I really liked the music videos because it was like, oh, this is their interpretation mm -hmm. of this sound, right? But I think now music videos, I think, are something else because there's a lot of other people involved in like create creating mm -hmm. the music video. But I just I I think like when I'm listening now, I take myself back to those days. So I listen to a lot of music on SoundCloud. Mm, okay. And and I love SoundCloud because that's where all the new young people are that like um, put all this experimental stuff on SoundCloud. So they'll just put it on SoundCloud and you can just go on SoundCloud and just find all this amazing music. And I think what I do with the SoundCloud, I do kind of the same thing. I'm like, 
checking out the artists. I'm like trying to find their pictures. I'm like looking for if there's their social media, like trying to see, you know, so uh, I'm just getting into like a lot of these new young artists and 99.9% .9 of them, like I never heard of them before. It's literally just like, oh, that sounds cool. Um, and, and I, I guess I go through like, you know, this kind of like, um, process of like, they have now where you could like kind of hear music that's like similar to the other music. Mm, okay. And I forgot what they call it. Oh, and so in Spotify, I think they call it like your daily mix, but it's kind of something like that. And then it's like this one, it's kind of like a Pandora, but not exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's like this one, if you like this one, you might like that one. So I try to, so I kind of find new people like that. And then it's like a combination of that. I do read like these lists. I don't believe in these lists because I still believe they're curated by white boys, which is annoying. Like your complex, your hype beast, your fader, like mm -hmm. these type of things. But I have found some gems <laughs> like searching through there because they'll do these lists like um, 25 Gen Z um, rappers you should be listening to. And it's like, mm -hmm. I'll go through there and I'll be like, I don't know. I like, I kind of halfway like this one, one song or whatever, you know? So that's how I'm like, I'm kind of doing that. The young, you know, the young people keep me on point. And mm -hmm. then I kind of get these recommendations from listening to, you know, um, you know, just interesting artists on like the SoundCloud. I mean, I do the Spotify too. Um, and then, and then I'll check out like their YouTube or their Instagram. Um, yeah, I'm not really on TikTok. You know, I don't, I don't like scroll TikTok, you know what I mean? So, but I think that a lot of new music is on TikTok, mm -hmm. um, which I want to do a show with Jared Ball about TikTok and everything that's going on with TikTok right now <laughs> and Warner Brothers and all the things. <laughs> you know, like I wish, you know, I, I would very much like to do a music show on YouTube, but it just seems too prohibitive, right? Like it's too mm -hmm. restrictive. If you can't play the music freely and know that your content's not going to be stricken or taken down, like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's yeah. too much like stress it's like god damn is the are, are youtube cops gonna come knocking on my channel and snatch my shit you know what i mean yeah like, or demonetize uh. you and because oh, like my, my friend is a dj she says she puts like a sound under her so the algorithm can't detect it mm, interesting and then now you've got like all these other all these other little tricks you could do but I'm not gonna lie. I did a music show with my friend DJ. She played Prince. I got a strike, and they <laughs> muted my thing. And I was like, "Girl, you know, oh. Prince led this fight. Why would you play that?" Right. <laughs> right. That part. Oh, it's so weird when I hear Prince music places. I'm like, did would, would he have signed off on us? <laughs> you know what Probably I mean? Probably not. Would Prince have signed off on this? Uh. So, what are you looking forward to in terms of like? music or culture or because we're in like such an open time um it's again it's hard for me to say what i'm looking forward to because i'm doing a lot of looking backwards when it comes to music um i'm i'm very much into mining uh, like my, for some reason, I'm so interested in what my grandmothers would have been listening to. You know what I mean? Like, so my, my, the way my family is set up, <laughs> we, we staggered out here. So I'm, I'm 45. My mother is 77. My, all my grandparents are deceased, but my mm -hmm. oldest grandparent was born in 1900. My youngest grandparent was born in 1916. Right. So I was dealing with much older folks, people that lived through the depression, um, people that were part of the great migration. Right. So I'm, I'm so like interested in what my grandmothers were listening to. And I know they were listening to both of them, Ella Fitzgerald for sure. Yes. Um, my, my grandma Edna from who moved from rural Virginia to Baltimore when my grandparents moved to Baltimore because my grandfather got a job at uh, Bethlehem Steel, which is what a lot of a lot of people move from country Virginia to Baltimore to go work at the steel mill. And my grandparents moved up in the 30s. And in uh, West Baltimore, Pennsylvania Avenue, over there by near not too far from where Freddie Gray got killed, was was a mm -hmm. a a re a a 
cultural um, hub of blackness and they had the Royal theater there. And I know my grandma parents used to go see Ella Fitzgerald perform. And in the sixties, my mother used to go to the James Brown review, like all day at the Royal mm. theater. So, so I'm so interested in like 20th century black music. It, Cause I, I feel like I'm well-versed in my era, you know, eighties, nineties, two thousands. I feel like I, I got a grasp of that, but this older music, like even beyond my mama's music, even beyond like the funk stuff, like what was grandmama and them listening to? And when I listen to these Ella Fitzgerald records, and then there's mm -hmm. a um, like Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong have like yes. many, many albums together, right? Yes, yes, it, it, yes. Uh, it is such like a beautiful um contrast of you know Ella's sweetness and Louis, you know, that gruff Sachimo, but it he has one of the most iconic, and I and I hate when people overuse iconic because everything ain't fucking iconic. But Louis Armstrong, I think, is safe to say <laughs> that, yeah. that he is iconic. And and so when I listen to that music, I don't know, like I'm just so I, I'm it, it's it's incredible to incredible to me, like the recording techniques, the musicianship, um, the the actual live recording process. Like this is not. Ella recording right. in New York and sending her verse to fucking Louis in in LA and then he record and he sent his shit. No, they was in the studio together. They was in there harmonizing together. When Louis would finish singing, he would pick up his horn and start playing as the rest of the band was playing as everything is recording at the same time. Like you know, like so the recording techniques, the musicianship, like all of this stuff I just find so fascinating because the yes. brilliance and the masterpieces of what black folks was able to come up with in the toughest of times, post depression, mm -hmm. height of Jim Crow, all of that shit and look at what we were still putting out there. Incredible stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's so much music that I'm still discovering. And like growing up, my dad was a huge jazz fan. Mm -hmm. And so my dad would like smoke weed and like <laughs> put the jazz, put the jazz on. And I would be there just like, <laughs> like listen and like listening. And, and, um, contacts. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and, and he'd be like, you hear that? That's that horn from, you know, or do you hear that? This, that, those keys, you know, or he'd be like, listen to that. And then he would make you listen for like these different moments. And, you know, he would explain all the music and then he would talk about, you know, what like stories about what would happen and who, and I always tell this story, like my, my dad passed away in 22 and before my dad passed away, we had a conversation, right. And we used to talk about when, when me and my dad would talk, we would always talk, he was a Hollywood actor. So oh, wow. we would always talk about like, music film and it was always like production our whole relationship is like talking about production and the last conversation we had he was telling me that he was like a play that he was in that he that um dorothy ashby did the music for and he was talking about how he, she was his friend and i was like are you freaking kidding me why did i not know that Dorothy Ashby was your friend. Do you know that she's one of my most favorite musicians in the whole oh, wow. entire world? And he was like, really? I could have, he was like, I, I, I guess I could have guessed that. But it was like, it's like Dorothy Ashby is like the pinnacle to me. And there's this young woman named Brandy Younger. And she plays the harp. And she's, mm -hmm. I don't know if she's a millennial or Gen Z. She is so amazing. She does, she's got like one song with Moon Moon Fresh, but she has so many great albums. I consider her a hip hop artist, but she's really a jazz musician, mm -hmm. but she plays all, she has all instrumental albums. And it's kind of in the vein of like this Dorothy Ashby and Alice Coltrane, which she also has songs that she does, you know, uh, renditions of theirs. But if you can check out Brandy Younger, B R A N D E E Younger, she is phenomenal um, harpist. So that's like the as far as like new music, I'm mm -hmm. really getting into these like musicians. There's a lot of young women mm. that are that are doing music that are doing that are musicians and they're they're doing hip hop, but it's like hip hop violin or you know, um, and they're 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 taking like orchestral stylings and they're 
either like playing hip hop music or like redoing music in a hip hop styling type of way or jazz. That's kind of like where I am right now. And, and I'm, I'm like, ah, That's maybe I'll be there for a minute. Yeah. No, that I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged to, to hear you say that because that that's something that I fear is well, and maybe my fear is misplaced, but I fear that musicianship amongst black folks, younger black folks is being lost. And we can kind of see the reasons why that, that could be happening and why that would happen. I mean, we, we, how long have we seen music programs be cut? How many decades now? You know what I'm saying? Like there's no, there's no band or there's no choir or, you know, basic music appreciation is not taught. And for your father, um, to engage with you and in the music in that way and to point out things about the the piece that he wanted to highlight for you. Um, I really dig that, you know, and I, I, my mom used to do that for me as well. And my mom's not an artist, right? My mother was a secretary, <laughs> but she had such an appreciation um, for, for musicianship and, you know, ooh, listen to Ernie Osley play that guitar. <laughs> you know, right. You know who, yeah. You know, to learn, you know, Jimi Hendrix learned from Ernie, I, you know, that kind of mm. stuff. And so I, I, my concern as a non-parent, right. I'd be, mm -hmm. I'd be, I got, I got all the advice for parents, parents come see me, but no kids, I, I, got, <laughs> I, I can tell y'all how to raise our kids. <laughs> but, but my concern is that but parents are not curating their kids taste, not to say that you have to pick out what you're trying to, you know, whatever you want your kids to listen to, but you, but th there has to be a, a curation of taste about what is good, what is bad. Like you can have your opinions, you could think, you know, but no, there are actual lines of demarcation between good musicianship, bad musicianship, good vocalization, bad vocalization, good rapping, poor rapping, right? Like, I mean, and, and let the kids make their own decisions, but I feel as though too many of the children are being left out here in the wild <laughs> and, and not being, not given any curation, not given any like historical context about music or about rap or, you know, listening to these, you know, I guess they would call it old music. Like, do the kids even have an appreciation for Whitney Houston? You understand? Like, I mean, th these are the things that I worry that could be getting lost with some of the younger generations. You know, it's interesting. I feel like, yes, and... There's also like this sort of rebelliousness with young people and they're like creating their like collectives and they're like doing a lot of experimentation. Mm -hmm. I see them doing these like where they meet up at each other's houses or like different spaces and then they're like co-creating. So you'll see them like learning how to make beats on like whatever software beat machine, but then mm -hmm. like mixing that with like learning, they're like on YouTube, like trying to teach themselves how to like play guitar. And oh, then wow. you'll see them like get together and then they'll like chronicle like their process. It's like, a, there's like an, a, a culture of that, um, that I'm seeing um, with the young people. It's really refreshing. Mm. And um, I like to, I like to dip in. They let granny, <laughs> dip in and check them out every now and then. Uh, but, but it's really, it's really, you know, promising. I actually mm. want to put out a mixtape with a lot, with these young women who um, are teaching themselves how to use software and make beats. Wow. So I want to put out a beat tape with them uh, next year. Um, mm. A lot of them have just, you know, they're, you know, I, me, I'm trying to learn stuff on YouTube. I'm a Gen Xer. So I need a combination of like YouTube and mm -hmm. a lot of phone calls and like sit down with you and do it. They're able to like go on YouTube and X amount of time later. Now it's like, they know this stuff and they sound great. I'm like, that's wow. impressive. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm, kids, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm, all mm -hmm. children's. We'll see. We'll see. Well, you know what? You gave me like hour and a half of your life. Which I'm like, I really appreciate. I don't want to keep you. Oh, okay. I could, I could keep, I could keep going forever. Trust me. We're gonna have to like come back. <laughs> oh, before we go though, yes. you got mad love in the chat. Like all these people are like, go Kim, get it, Kim. Love hey, you, Kim. and they you. want you an ear doctor to do <laughs> something together. Like either y'all 
try to do a battle where y'all like try to race each other to know the end of the lyrics or something. What are we doing? Shazam? You want me and Ear Doctor going on Shazam? Is that what y'all saying? I, I'll go on Shazam with Ear Doctor. He got to push the buttons on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to come back. We'll have to, uh, you know, have some more conversation because like I really appreciate your perspective and I love mm -hmm. listening to your stories and learning more about your journey. Like it's fascinating. You know, you are uh, what we call here a culture creator. And a whoa, culture creator. Well, whoa. you're a culture keeper and a culture creator. You <laughs> oh, know, because, yes. Yeah, because it's like when, so you never know like who use, whose minds and opinions you shaped with your time on the radio. Like you never know who heard you like asking Jay Z, like, you know, you front, right? <laughs> And then think like, huh, that was brave. <laughs> and then be inspired by that. You know what I'm saying? Like you never know that. who you touch. You know? I have to find that because I feel like some of y'all think I'm lying and I'm not. I'm not lying. I, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't think lie. you're lying. I I'm just want to see it. Here. I got to find it. I got to find it. I think Kobe Cobe said he had that somewhere. I got to, I got to locate it. I think it lives somewhere. I would like to see that myself because sometimes when I look at myself younger, I'm like, wow, okay. I see you out there, a little fearless. You know what I'm saying? But I, but I, I feel as though um, Piper, one of my, I always want to make sure my name is Kunta. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the industry will try to make you Toby. You know what I'm saying? Mm. They will whip you. They will beat you. They will they will blacklist you. They will tear your name down. They will besmirch you. They will lie about you. Like I have, I found a letter. <laughs> I found a letter for once I got suspended from a radio station here in DC. And in the letter, the re would you like to know the reason I was suspended off the radio? It, Let's it, hear this ridiculousness. I should, I need to find the letter. I should have had it handy. So in short, I was hosting uh, like the Friday night mix, right? It's 11 PM midnight, Friday night. I'm in the air studio my homeboy uh, DJ exclusive was over there in, in the DJ booth. People that actually worked at the radio station came up to hang out with me in the studio. Not an uncommon thing, right? Like these weren't, these weren't my friends. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These are people coming from an event. They still got the street team shit on. They work here. They had key cards and shit. So anyway, so, okay, I'm doing a break. Yo, what's up? It's bullshit radio station is this you know we've been banging 18 jams in a row yo shout out to to this person that person what's up dj exclusive they in the bit you know in the studio rocking all right we going back to the mix blah 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 so the program director is pussy he called me up right i'm sorry not pussy pussy is strong this, this soft the scrotum skin this soft the scrotum skin motherfucker he gonna call me up. You're not supposed to have nobody in there with you. And da 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 da. So my next break. So everybody leaves. <laughs> okay. So my next break. Yo, what's up, y'all? It's KB DJ exclusive is way over there in the DJ booth, and that's exactly what I said. I said D. I said I'm in here just chilling by myself. <laughs> I said DJ exclusive is way over there in the DJ booth. Girl, the Monday. Here come the letter. You are indefinitely suspended for quote going at. The program director. Oh, he won the program. He was like assistant program director. You went at him on the air, is what they said. Really? That's yes. cool. that's going because you said he was way over on the other side. Because you said the DJ was way over on the other side. What's that about? I, it's about making sure I knew my place, girl. Mm. Don't, you don't know your place, little girl. I don't know. No, I don't. <laughs> Piper, how could I ever know my place with all these suckers? Like I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be subservient to suckers, and it's not like wow. like Buck. And that's again, that's why radio is in the in the position that it is. Like you, uh, you will never see, regardless of how much I dislike or disagree with how Wendy Williams made her made her chops in the business. You're never going to see a Wendy Williams again. You're never going to see a Howard Stern again because the the industry is so committed to creating clones, people that don't buck right like people mm. that that are that are yes sir okay sir anything you want to do sir the reason why wendy was successful the wind reason why howard stern was successful is because they constantly booked they constantly mm. pushed the envelope they constantly were trying to move the needle on the on the genre or on the on the medium you know what i mean and mm -hmm. again 
not my favorites, but I, I, I respect what I knew what they was doing. And, and mm -hmm. nobody has the room to do that now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't conform, then you, then you fucking up out here where there's no, there's no room for individual well, That's individual. what they're losing. Exactly. That's what they lost. It's boring. It's so boring. And that's why you have, you know, the thought leaders are Charlemagne, they're Angela Yee. And that's intentional. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I wasn't out here. It's not like others, I, many others. It's not like many others weren't out here. It's not where they wanted it to go, you know? The well, I'll say this. I'm happy about SoundCloud. <laughs> hey, SoundCloud. <laughs> that's where I find myself. I know, and, and I mean... In YouTube, you know, I find a lot of music YouTube. I I'm going to try to get into TikTok. It's just navigating TikTok for me is difficult because there's too much foolishness on there. Not that there's no foolishness anywhere else, but... Um... See, I haven't even <laughs> made it to music TikTok. Like, I'm I'm still in, in news TikTok. I'm still mm. in... Uh, nigga commentary TikTok. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get my way over to cooking TikTok because I, I love to pick up a new recipe. You know, so of the soul food or Indian food or any you know food variety. So I haven't even, I haven't even made it to music TikTok yet. Oh, okay. The the music TikToks that are dope. Yes. There's this guy. His name is Pat Smith. I think it's eight fifteen or something like that. Anyway, he is amazing. He plays like the um, the keyboard. And then he like does covers and, and, you know, like, well, everybody kind of does that like half screen thing and then yeah. they sing together, but the way he does it, he'll be like, let's do some. And then he'll be like Stevie wonder. And then he'll be like, dun, 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 dun. and then the other person, you are the sunshine of my life. Oh, wow. But it, it's so dope. But the way he does it, it's really cool. And you find like all these really amazing vocalists and, um, you know, musicians and just creatives on there. So that's a really good way to find music on TikTok is these people who do those like half screen things where they mm. sing together. And there's a lot of people doing those. And then they do the ones where it'll be like, um, like, they'll do like this kind of Bobby McFerrin thing that I'm calling it, where they'll like <laughs> make their body an instrument or do like a one sound. And then they'll like um, record that. And then they'll do the harmonies to it, like in all the parts. So they doing Rozelle basically. Rozelle from the roots, from the roots. Crew. Kind of, except they're all at the same time. Ah, so, okay. So one will be like the tenor or the ah. alto. And blah, well, what was the name it, of that white folks group? Mantronics? What's the shit? I know, chat. Y'all know who the hell I'm talking about. Technotronics. It, well, I know what's the name did that, like um, Take Six or something. Yes, yes. And then, but you then know, the whites kinda... came through. But it, I, I'm I'm being mean by saying the whites because I don't think it was <laughs> a couple brothers in there too. But it was the the mostly whites, and it's like six of them, and then they would be harmonizing like uh, Take Six, exactly like Take Six, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the sound. anyway. And then they'll have like all the people will be in the in the thing, and then what people do is they'll take that because it sounds like like a song with mm -hmm. instruments and then they'll they'll split that in half and then like they'll sing over that nice. so then and then they'll do it like a challenge like they had this um it was one for stevie wonder that went around it was this white boy doing it and i can't front it was really good i hate to admit <laughs> it on black power media but uh <laughs> but <there, laughs> he was doing stevie wonder i was like ah right. but um there's a there's like a lot of the TikTokers will kind of do that. So there's a whole culture of pe people in the music TikTok mm. that are like doing that kind of like, you know, either covers and show you how well they did the cover or they'll do original music and like on like they'll be like, OK, I made this melody or whatever, this song or whatever. And the other person they'll say, you know, it's a challenge with my song. Mm. And then the other people will pick it up and then they'll sing over it. And then they'll put then they'll put it on their TikTok, and then that kind of grows like that. Ah. So that's a whole culture of that. So that's the way that they're kind of to answer that question of the person before. That's the way that they're doing music on TikTok, which is why TikTok is looking at Warner Brothers like we don't need you. 
Mm. <laughs> I don't need you, don't need you. But the snake hey, is gonna eat itself, so we'll see. It, it's yeah, because I, I think uh, the bill or the, whatever the fuck in Congress to ban TikTok is advancing through the Congress, or either to try to get TikTok to divest or get, be sold by the Chinese company that owns it. So I don't know. Like I, I really hope America, the American government, does try to tick tick take TikTok away from the Utes because I think that's going to get. <laughs> You, you want to see Gen Z in the streets? Oh, you think Gen Z out there for Palestine? Take away TikTok and see what the fuck happened. Take away that TikTok and see what the fuck happened. Okay, Joe yeah. Biden, y'all keep it up. Okay. I think right. we, we have another super chat, baby. Oh, we do? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, Latif, big, but the big baller out here. Latif, Who's Robert Uncle Cole. Jimmy? <laughs> Who's Uncle Jimmy? It says it says big birthday shouts to my to your uncle Jimmy. Okay, so to oh it was a happy birthday to your uncle Jimmy. Hey. And it says thanks for holding me down this weekend. Okay, thanks for holding you down. That's what's Thank up. Thank you. Shout out to Uncle Jimmy. Happy birthday. Yeah, that's what's up. Yes, indeed. Man, this was so fun. I'm, I'm gonna have to come to Balmo. <laughs> How do you say Balmo? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I don't see it's and it's funny because like I forget that. We have accents around here until other people speak back the accent too. And they're like, oh, is that what you sound like? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not doing it right. I'm sorry. How do I say a Baltimore? No, Bal no, you you don't you have learned you have gotten Baltimore? that out. I don't know if you had radio training. <laughs> I, I think it's because I live different places. It, and it's weird mm. because as much as uh, my folks are from the country, like my grandparents are from the country, my, mm -hmm. both, both sets of grandparents are from the country. And they don't, they never sounded like country folks. Not, mm. not really, not in no, like my grandmother is from deep in Arkansas. My grandfather too, from deep in Arkansas. They never talked, they never spoke that way. My parents, neither one of my parents really have accents either or had mm, accents. Mm, so mm, mm. yeah, it's weird. I don't know, but I, I love the DC DMV accent. I love it. I love it. I love saying- I love curly. to hear uh, Snoop. From the wire. <laughs> oh, no, that's Baltimore. Like Baltimore, Baltimore, like Baltimore. Like, and it's hard. Like, you have to, I, I can't even. The only thing, the only Baltimore thing I say that sounds that comes out is in Baltimorean is hot dog. Hot dog. Okay, okay. Like I'm trying, I'm trying to say hot dog. Hot, hot dog. Hot dog. <laughs> hot dog. <laughs> like, well, if you ever see in I really hate that Snoop got arrested. But if you ever see that video where, where Snoop got arrested and they came up on her from the street, she went off. She was like, I guess she was like, I'll, I'll tire these, uh, I, I can't even do the accent, but she, How if you, you want to hear a Baltimore accent, look up Snoop getting arrested. And um, she was basically saying, like, I'm out of here. I got to get away from these people in Baltimore. I got to go to California. <laughs> wow. But, but she says it in the most Baltimorean of, like, dialects. <laughs> and it's, like, it's, like, so thick. And it's, like, oh, yeah, that's Baltimore. <laughs> These are hard accents to replicate, right? Like it's yeah. People, like tr try to assume a Baltimore accent. Just you know the way people you know fake pick up New York accents. You know what I'm saying? Like you, mm -hmm. I, I think it's easy to pick up easier to badly pick up a New York accent. Yeah, than to actually try to repeat stuff in either the Baltimore accent or the DC accent, and they are different things right they they're different because because baltimore is difficult dc is <laughs> difficult but but dc does everything er 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 <laughs> everything is like er <laughs> but but baltimore there's like a whole way you have to like redo your mouth to, to say <laughs> yes and the pronouns and the link like i love like baltimoreans say yo you know but not like but yo is a pronoun, you know what I'm saying? And mm. yo, I'm talking about yo over there. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yo. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, yo, yo came over and talk about yo. And then I was like, yo. Right, and then this right, yo, right. And, and I love how in Baltimore, you know, everything, everybody's a whore. Like, everybody's a whore. <laughs> I love it. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, these cops are whores out here. Like, everybody's right, a right, whore. Right. And I, well, oh, you know like, who else does that is Miami. But they say whore <laughs> 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 easy, easy. 
East Coast, East Coast things, Indeed. East Coast things. That's yes, what's up. But- Piper, I so appreciate. Thank you so much for inviting me. This has been a lot of fun. I would love to come back. Uh, thank yeah, you, you got to come back. That, that joined us tonight. And yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like there's a lot more more places we could we could go. You know. Yeah, in, in yeah. But this was like it was good to hear your story, though. That's really oh, fascinating. Wow. That's that's just yeah. a part of it. But that that's the interesting part. So thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so we got to check you out. Tuesday through Thursday. On usually, the- yes. Usually, so, okay. <laughs> tomorrow, um, because there there is an important um event happening tomorrow evening. Unfortunately, at the same time as my show, will my producer, my my the the gentleman who very, um. Uh, adroitly presses the buttons. Uh, Will's going to be filling in for me tomorrow night, y'all. I have something that I I would like to be at, so I'm not going to be able to be on the show tomorrow. So tune in to Burn It Down with Kim Brown Tuesday at 7. Will is going to be my guest host. So y'all be sure to check out Will, Brother Will, Good Wilbert. Uh, He's going to be filling in for me, and I will be back on Friday. But thank you for pu- pushing the show, Piper. Yeah, it's it's every Tuesday and Friday. But I just wanted to remind the people: I, don't look for me tomorrow because I ain't gonna be okay. on there tomorrow. But yes, okay. But it's, it's seven both days, right? That is correct. Yes, ma'am. So I didn't realize it was two days. So thanks for that. Tuesdays for and Friday, and I need okay, to do better. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not. I don't do a good job. I, I need to be pushing my joint on the morning show more. But I just be forgetting sometimes, and I just you know really enjoy the company and the conversation of my comrades. So I be forgetting. But I appreciate BPM uh, supporting. And there's a lot of crossover between my channel and BPM. There's we, we share viewers, and I'm grateful um, for for that. And I appreciate. I'm so glad that you were on the platform as well, Piper. I, I love your perspective. I love. Uh, your expertise, your history that you bring to this. And and I really appreciate that you you still staying on top of hip hop and rap culture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> granny, <laughs> granny don't stop. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that you have the energy to do that. And, you know, and that that's that's fantastic. And I thank you for doing that, because I'm sure you were bringing a perspective and a context to younger consumers of rap, you know what I'm saying? That they may not otherwise be getting. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, so thank you. And thanks to the chat for tuning thank in, you. coming through. Look how many people <laughs> came. Like most of these people came for you, Kim, because my views are not this big. <laughs> so, hey, that's what's up. Hey, so I'm glad, Piper, I'm glad people, y'all showed up. Tell tell the people when when they when when does Beyond Breaking Barriers air? Usually. So every Monday. I'm here on Black Power Media at eight o'clock and, you know, Eastern time talking about women in hip hop, you know, or with women in hip hop, you know? So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just so, uh, have you, have you talked to Dream Hampton yet? <sighs> she, she did, uh, Kalanji show. Yes. She yes. did Kalanji show. I don't know if I can get her on because she, she told me she's not hip hop. That's what she say, and she's not know. wrong. But I'm sorry, like, but for we'll see. Dream Hampton, like I, I'm telling you, and see, I I stand Dream Hampton in such a big way, but I I I, I stand her well enough to know that she doesn't like being stand. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, like, and like she, she she told me she doesn't like like you know because I've always tried to get her to do. Di- she did one thing for me I, when I. The first Dilla day that I did was a uh, uh, was in Detroit, and it was um, my Dukes is the foundation, and we had my mm-hmm. Dukes, and we made her an award and this whole thing, and and Dream, um, I asked her to give the award to my Dukes, and she did mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But other than that, like I I've asked her to do like a Twitter storm, I've asked her to do like a bunch of different stuff. She's like, I'm not hip hop, and like that's not me. You know, I don't, I'm not a hip hop person, so. I, I could try again and see. Uh, and actually, when we did the mute R. Kelly um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. protest in Detroit, if you look in the um, the uh, surviving R. Kelly film, mm-hmm. the protest in that film is the protest that that we organized. Oh, the, okay. The mute R. Kelly in Detroit. So we organized that. You won't see me in the protest because I was telling people I got like two hundred and fifty 
death threats and our threats. So I was like, I'm not coming. I would stay away. But she was like, can I film y'all the protests? And I was like, yeah. So she went down, you know, we connected. So that is all our comrades and everything in that. So, I mean, we talk, we're cool. We're comrades, sisters, you know, all that. But I don't, but I feel like her marketing wise, she doesn't want to be like marketed as hip hop. That's what she's said to me. But we'll see. I will see if maybe Kalanji can get her on my show. I, I would, but I would like to hear, and again, your dream don't care what I want to hear, but that's fine. <laughs> but like, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. she has so much historical context. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, I, I don't listen to the shit either, Dream. Like, I don't, I, I feel you. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't be listening to it no more anyway. But I mean, at the time, like, I, like she was part of my entry point into into hip hop culture. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Knowing that this woman was 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 writing these pieces about women's experiences, about women getting abused, about women's treatment. And again, I was a very young and very impressionable. And, and again, I'm four, I'm 45 big years old. Like I never forgot that Piper. You know what I'm saying? Mm. From a kid. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I know. And, and the way I remember Dream in the context of rap and hip hop, I know she obviously does not see herself in that way. But the, the things that she saw at that point in rap, I, I know she has a lot to offer, but I'm sure who I, I mean, it, it's going to come off as tea, though. You understand? Because, you know, Dream mm. shit. <laughs> she she was around everybody. She saw a lot of things. So anyway, I, I would like. Let's to see. Let's see if she'll come on. I mean, if she won't come on my show, she might come on yours. <laughs> no, but see, you never know. She would, but for I, I, I've had the pleasure to interview Dream Hampton once, and it, but it what, had nothing to do with rap. Had nothing to do with hip hop. It, it was. Uh, do you remember a, a young woman outside of Detroit? Her name was Renisha McBride. Oh yeah, rest in peace. Yes, yes. Uh, I mm -hmm. had Dream come on. Um, when I was working at Russian radio, I interviewed she did Dream the film Hampton. on that. Yes, mm -hmm. she did. Yep. She did the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, but I, I appreciate dream as an artist. I appreciate her as a documentarian, as an activist, all the things she does. I just, I, I will never disconnect her from rap just because that's how I discovered her was kind of through rap and through rap culture through the source. Okay, let's see. Let's see if she can either come on my show or your show. <laughs> if, or some way. Let's see. Let's see if we could get her to do it. Might have to talk to Kalanji. <laughs> I, would to, I would love to get her take. I mean, I know she, I mean, girl, all, all the shit is coming out now. You know what I'm saying? Motherfuckers, you didn't think what, not her specifically, but we, as mm -hmm. a, you know, we didn't see, we ain't never know Diddy would fall. We didn't know if R. Kelly would fall. We didn't know what we didn't know. And I feel like the, the sheets is being snatched off. Well, and I'll say this back when, the the Me Too stuff first happened. I don't. My first thought was, "What are they gonna go in the hip hop?" <laughs> that was my first thing. I was like, "When they gonna talk about Diddy? When they gonna talk about Jay Z? When they gonna talk about Russell?" But but they did. I don't know. Russell is surviving <laughs> the Me Too because. They got him, and then he went to Bali, and I guess he laid low, and now he's on TV doing promos that he opened up a new space, and he's, like, advertising for people to come there for a, re for a healing retreat. This was recently, and I'm what like, how I'm do you do that? My, what if I'm trying to heal from my alleged Russell Simmons rape? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, right. What? Oh. It's, it's really weird. It's really weird. No, it's a lot of weirdness happening. It's really uh, that, weird. That whole Usher thing, that was weird. And I'm that like, okay, weird. That, again, the signaling is happening. They're trying to bring Russell back into the fold. They're trying to clear the way for Russell to come back. And that's important for us to make sure that people don't forget why Russell is gone in the first fucking place. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. let's not play games here, y'all. Either this, either, either we going for the shit, either we are accepting rape and rape culture and rapist, or we not. <laughs> it's, it's really yeah. bad. That's all. Oh, well, I do want to just remind folks, my guest that I had last week, Martha Diaz, mm -hmm. has her event in New York City, April 5th. And it's a women in hip hop event. It's going to be at Lincoln Center. Oh, wow. And um, it's going to be all the women pioneers of hip hop. Dope. It's gonna be like a whole day. If you can make it to New York City, can yeah, on Friday, the April the fifth. It's a whole day and night. 
but um, it's like they're going to have a healing conversation. They're going to have like all these different um, women who were there at the beginning. Mm. And so um, it's, it's going to be powerful. I'm, I bet. I'm going and uh, yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, I got to go to that. So mm-hmm. if y'all can go, <laughs> it's, 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 I would recommend it. I bet. Mm-hmm. I bet. No, that, yeah. I mean, we are still going through it. You know what I'm saying? This culture is, is not without its flaws. It's not without its problems. It's not without its misogyny. It's not without its anti-blackness. It's not without a lot of things. So I guess if we're trying to better the culture, then it's important that people like Piper Carr stay engaged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stand outside. I'm gonna stand outside the club throwing rocks. You know what I'm saying? You know, Chris mm-hmm. Brown talking about I can't get in the club. I'm hating from outside the club. Yes, I am hating from outside the club. You got that correct. Mm-hmm. So. Chris Brown is another one. <laughs> People keep trying to cape for him. I'm like, yo, he his list is long. The 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 the, the, the what is it? Like he's a killmonger. <laughs> like, but uh, you know, I mean, I say get them all up out of here. You know, um, people, you know, need to be able to not get beat up and not get, you know, harmed trying to make beautiful music, <laughs> trying to, you know, like what on earth? Um, yeah, get them all up out of here. <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, under capitalism, be, mm. you know, there were, there will always be predators and prey, right? And, and mm-hmm. people like Russell's, you know, king makers like Diddy, you know, they understand the the thirst <laughs> and the in the desperation mm-hmm. um, you know, and in the ways that people are willing to allow themselves to be degraded in order to get access to those spaces, to get access to what they perceive to be the glamorous life. And it's like, well, it's it's not so glamorous if Diddy can't keep his hands out at your pants, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how much fun you're having when you're constantly being, you know, sexually harassed or accosted or propositioned or even worse. Right. So, yeah, the list is long of the things they do, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, it sucks that, you know, all these people got to get canceled because then it's like, ah, I love that song, you know, but I mean, my main thing, that's (laughs) what I'm mad about. Like, I mean, Come on now, bad boy. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna be hard to, you know, set aside some of the bad boy catalog because them joints is some of my favorite joints, you know. I mean, I grew up in the Michael Jackson days, and I was at one of uh, this was 20 what 18, 2018, and I was at a uh movement for black lives, like leadership team meeting and we were talking music and I was like I can't love Michael Jackson anymore and they were like no girl I was like but didn't the two white boys lie and they were like girl please I was like oh I I think I think what it is they lied but there is a book and I really hate that I don't have the name of the book and I'm gonna try to find the book and I'm not gonna lie I did read and and who knows I mean, books are books. Some, you know, who knows? I'll just say what it said in the book. I don't know. I can't confirm or deny if this book is accurate. And I can't even remember the name of the book. But there was a part of the book where it talked about, where it, where it said that the so-called uh, investigators or the, the who comes and like takes the evidence when they come, when they get to the scene. The crime scene, the CSI. Those people. They found... It's a, allegedly a, in Michael Jackson's bed, some little boy tidy whities with the boo boo stains on them, and that was in one of the books. Mm. And I was like, "Huh." Hmm. And the thing is, it's it's like as an abolitionist, it's like you know these a lot of times you know it's difficult to understand because these books are not written by like the people that that you know, are making these claims, Mm -hmm. right? These are books that, um, you know, people are writing and everyone has a reason that they write a book. So you never know if, you know, because it happens, is this person, you know, what is the agenda of this person? And I hate to say it like that, 
But it's like when these books come out and they're not from the people, right? They're like from Caucasian men who want to sell books, obviously. And so it's just, it's like, it's, it's a hard thing to understand. Do you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. is this true? Do I and believe especially, it? Especially <sighs> coming out of Me Too, where, I, you know, the one positive thing that came out of Me Too that I agree with is that, you know, I, I, I believe survivors. Now, some yes. sometimes everybody that comes out, everybody is not telling the truth. And in the my from where I sit, if you're not being truthful, the shit will come out sooner or later. Okay. Right, but right, right. So historically, so many people have been disbelieved when they have been harmed. Exactly. Right? Like exactly. I'm okay, blank blanket statement. I believe survivors, right? Yes. But where, more of my contradiction comes in is is specifically what Michael Jackson, though, because because I don't believe Michael did that. And 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 I can be the goofy for that. I can be caping for my favorite, you know, for that. And that's fine. I'm I'm willing to take that criticism. I'll be I'll be wrong, it, you know, if if indeed Michael did do those things. But it's like I, I know there are some instances in which false allegations are are set out in order to you know smear someone or to to ruin their reputation or for financial gain and and I and I get that. So Michael is is always that kind of gray area with me just because of who Michael Jackson was to me in my childhood. Yeah, you know, same. and 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 the you know beyond the reverence, again, like I just feel. I just feel like Michael Jackson didn't do that shit. I, I feel like Michael Jackson was weirdo for sure. And everybody knows why Michael is likely a weirdo. He was on the chitlin circuit since he was nine. And who in the hell knows what was done to oh, Michael God. or what he saw, you know, yeah. out there on the road, <laughs> you know, be, people only half-ass looking at him. I do have my suspicions about Michael Jackson and a, um, a, a legendary singer from Motown. I'll, I'll just leave it there. Um, woman singer. It's so I, I I don't know what Michael went through. So that, that there definitely lies my contradictions with I believe survivors because I I have to say I don't believe I don't believe Michael's accusers, and maybe that's fucked up. Well, those guys, those two particular white men, said they lied. Mm -hmm. But I guess parent, the parents that put doesn't it mean it. that he didn't do that to others. Others, right? So, right. so like. Um, I think there was like Macaulay Culkin came out and has said it did. And then he came back and said he didn't. And anyway, there were several different people who came out. And I guess that's my contradiction because it's like, man, I love Michael Jackson's voice and his music. And it's so powerful. And it's like to, and, and I guess that's my, that's where I'm failing in my uh, ability to like stay steadfast. Yeah. And and but you know what, Piper, we we just gotta admit it. We just gotta own it. Like we're not gonna yeah. sit here and deny. Well, I it, you know I ain't gonna run down all the reasons I think Michael didn't do it. I mean I don't know. I hope mm -hmm. he didn't do it. Is <laughs> is what yeah. it comes down to. So anyway, you know what that we we're not gonna be perfect in in our analysis and in, in our conclusions at all times. So we have to accept that as well. And and I feel like a hypocrite because I'm telling you I'm banging hard yeah. on R. Kelly. <laughs> right, girl. I, but see, R. Kelly, R. Kelly was way. I feel like R. Kelly was R. Kelly shit was happening at a time where I at least had a little bit of flicker of consciousness, right? Like mm. again, like me, uh, Aaliyah was born January of '79. I'm born July of '78. Like I remember when the stories about Ali and R. Kelly getting married was happening. I remember that me and my friends in high school would talk about that shit. Right. My homegirl in 98 bought the 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 child sex abuse DVD of R. Mm -hmm. Kelly from mm -hmm. the fucking barber shop. You understand? Like mm -hmm. I, I, we, we lived we, we came up through some bad times. <laughs> we did come up through some terrible time. And I and I'm telling you, R. Kelly is on a whole nother level than whatever the fuck Michael Jackson was doing. That nigga. well, that shows you like the power of Barry Gordy. Because if you actually listen to like most of those Motown songs, they're saying, I love you, little girl my girl like they're singing you know and and there's uh, throughout history there's like so many songs that's like singing to like she was only 17 but she was young and fine and oh so tender oh shit. And, 
<laughs> That's Rick James. And I mean, Prince had the 17. And I mean, I mean, there's so many of our faves who and Apollonia came out uh was it a couple in the last few years and was spilling the tea on how Prince was emotionally and physically abusive to her. I believe and that. I believe well, it. Carmen you know. Electra also said that too about Prince. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like as now as a five two woman, am mm -hmm. I going to allow a five two man to beat me? This is a question. <laughs> like, well, I mean, I'm just I'm being facetious. I'm being facetious. No, because I'm like, like oh, this is even the joke thing. about that. Like you know, you know, because because uh, also too in the land of all that, you know, there's the whole like, how do people get a chance to be in that space? Right. Cause that's what the whole thing is about mm -hmm. that. It's like the doorway. Right. And it's like, this is your doorway into the space. And even with that sort of doorway into the space, there's still the like, yeah, but, but now you got to do, now you got to jump over this hurdle. There's a price to pay. <laughs> right. And it's not, it's not like even you pay the one price. Mm -mm. Right. No. Cat Williams was talking about that in the Club Shay Shay interview. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, and and I hope one day somebody does do a comprehensive interview with, with Cat Williams and asks him about these little nuggets that he keeps dropping. And he's not like even being like secretive with it. People are just not hitting him with follow up questions. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I feel like the reason Cat Williams keeps doubling down on his heterosexuality and keeps telling us over and over again, even though nobody asked him that his 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 his, his anus is intact. It's like he's. He's telling, he keeps telling us this because yeah. that's the price of admission to get to that next level of Hollywood. You got to give up, you got to give up the booty hole. Okay. Like, yeah, but even, even like, I mean, to be honest, it's not even just that. Right. So I'll say even like in the fashion industry, I mean, I saw it, you know, the, to become a model, you know, to, of that, you know, caliber right in the high fashion world they scout them they have model scouts that are paid like you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to be a model scout they travel the world and they find these children when they're mm. like 11 and 12 years old and they're like six feet tall but they're like 11 and 12 and then they they start bringing them to new york city to live without their parents mm. and then they're sending them to europe to go work and do all this, get their portfolios together and like living in a model house. And then they've just got like their booker or whatever watching them, which is somebody that's like 30 years old. And what they don't tell you, which Tyra Banks kind of said on her show mm -hmm. when she had the model show um, and she made, and she was like saying to those girls that like they need, they, they should have seen once where she had like a party and she invited all these like rich people to the party. And the, the black girl was like, I'm not doing that. Like I'm not. And Tyra was like, you got to entertain them. And I don't remember it was a, I don't remember her name, but she was really chocolate and she had short hair. And she was like, I'm not going to do that. And Tyra like berated her, you know, like, this is what you do with this industry. And the girl was like, I'm a top model. Thank you. And she was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And Tyra, like, literally, like, almost chewed that girl's head off. And um, then she explained, you know how they have, like, the talking head. Well, this is what you have to do to make it. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to make it. But what they, what they, what she didn't say is a lot of the black girls are used as either mules or exchanges. And there's a lot of rich people that are in the industry that are like these counts and dukes and uh, Wall Street and all these kind of people, shakes and everything. And that's where they send the, a lot of the black models to like work. And that's why a lot of them, they don't get, you know, mm. these gigs doing all these magazines and stuff. And they don't tell you that that's how the um, model agencies like make most of their money. Cause there's no real money in magazines. Magazines, you don't make money in that. Like I, when I was shooting for Vogue, they paid $150 
uh, and you and it took like 18 months to get your 150 bucks. Damn. For like a six for like a eight page story. So people don't, you know, magazines lose money. Well, I don't know about 2024, what magazines are doing. I'm talking about <laughs> back in my day, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. magazines are like, it's marketing. They lose money. It's where it's basically an investment for the brands. Right. And so the whole thing is like a shell game, but where the real money is, is all these like military and oil and all this kind of political stuff that's going on that we know now, like Halliburton, all types of weird stuff. Mm -hmm. And like fashion doesn't really make money. So a lot of, a lot of what we, what, what we're seeing is like, when we talk about like this human trafficking and all this stuff, the industry is completely complicit. Allegedly. Cause, we're <laughs> but I'm just saying the industry is completely complicit because the truth be told, a lot of this stuff like doesn't make money. But how are these people making millions of dollars? And if you think about it, you pay $5 for a magazine. Now you split that. How many, like how many people make money off that $5 on that magazine? Not too many, you know, that's not, you're not making money. Essence owes people. I, Essence still owes me money. Oh man. A few th thousands of dollars, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm not mad about it. I get it. Black magazine don't have money, whatever. But these, these magazines and things, they're basically, they're just marketing investment. And then that's why they do the media. That's why they get into like, you know, television or they get into, it's a whole thing. So if they really, really, really start really digging into like what this thing is really about and you really start unraveling, which is why all these people are shook. <laughs> Like that's what that whole Epstein thing was about. And that whole, when you really start to like peel back and see like, oh, whoa, you know what I mean? Like it's all, it's all connected to like military and like all, all this crap that we, that we are seeing, that we're seeing revealed in this moment. And that's mm -hmm. not conspiracy. <laughs> that's not no. like gossip hearsay fake news like <laughs> no i mean I'm, I'm pretty sure like it's documented that one of the alphabet boys fbi cia whoever well, well you know jeffrey epstein was one of their associates or informant or whatever and they were using his itineraries and his guest list and whoever was flying to and fro epstein island and using that as, as blackmail you know sources you know what i'm saying well said politician we know that you was on jeffrey epstein's plane with this 14 year old going to the island to get with these 13 year olds you know what i mean so if you want this information to stay quiet then you'll do xyz the way we want you to and that's that's interesting i guess that's i mean the whole situation is not all well and good but the exposure of it i'm here for but now i'm here it's like okay now do black people <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like, okay, now th that's great. Now, now expose all those same horrible people that are within our community that have awards and scholarships and all this shit named after them. Like, I mean, Howard University, how, I, how are they going to in some way detangle, you know, their way, their themselves away from Sean Combs? You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, it's on film. <laughs> <laughs> you know like, you know, yeah, every everybody has had their hand out and taken this this dirty person's dirty money and and skinned and grinned the whole time. You know, that's what, I'm what Diallo calls them race traitors. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Honestly, one of the most insightful people with one of the best flows on this platform is Diallo. Dog. Yes, <laughs> Diallo is the ghost face killer of BPM. <laughs> Yo, son. I think that's fair. You know what I'm saying? I think that's very fair. And 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 I I appreciate yeah because he he do he do spit it like very much like a rapper. You know what I'm saying? I dig that. He definitely does have flow. 
Man, man, kill. We are here a long time. We break so off sorry. this internet. I'm sorry. No, no, I, no. But wait, I wanted to say peace to everybody and uh in the chat for sticking with us. Y'all was hanging out. Actually, it grew. <laughs> what up, Zenzi Bell? Did you and Zenzi Bell know each other at Howard? Y'all was around. I'm trying to time? remember because Zenzi Bell's name seems so familiar, and I just can't. We know all the same people, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I know Zenzi Bell, but I'm like, I don't feel like we hung out though. I hope but it, it wasn't feels Zenzibel. like we were I hope around wasn't. each other or something. I hope it wasn't Zenzibel that you ended up fighting in the club that one night. <laughs> no, thank God. It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> Actually, I don't even know who that was. <laughs> I don't even know who it was. Okay, she was there. Okay, so she left before me. So I was at Howard from 90 to 94 and she was there 86 to 90 so zenzibo ah. was there when i was in high school that was my high school years 86 okay. to 90 okay so just yeah each other. Got it, but got we it. know a lot of the same people but she was there when your boy puff daddy was there <laughs> and he was a whole mess when he zenzi he was a mess even then you could, <laughs> you could not leave your drink around diddy in 89 dog. <laughs> like don't leave your drink around sean because he oh uh, right Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to have a. I, I keep telling Doctor Ball we have to have a music industry, uh, <laughs> series with his myth of black buying power book, and we hey. gotta get you on there with that conversation for the music industry one. Yep, and and I mean Kalanji would be a good part of that conversation too. From oh from yes, his perspective, I, I, and I don't fully know what all Kalanji did, but I know he was around the country doing it. So I mean, I think he was producing concerts. Oh, he's promoter, and Pro, yeah, and, and he was doing street teamy stuff, right? Street mm -hmm, promotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which, so you know, which which is a lost art form, right? Like street yes. promotions, like that shit don't even exist anymore in the way. Well, I do industry. it. Oh, for my shows, okay. <laughs> I do my own street team. You got posters on the light poles out there in Detroit. <laughs> well, let me tell you what I did. I did. I did Detroit's first women in hip hop conference and concert. Nice. And I went and got a grant to do it. And I, um, I brought Rhapsody yes. to Detroit. This was when nobody knew who she was. Mm -hmm. And I could, and I was promoting and promoting and nobody wanted to buy a ticket. Cause they were like, who? And uh, it was only $25, but, you know, it was an all-woman show. We had, like, the B-Girls opening, and then I had um, the all-woman band, and then, like, the different MCs, women MCs, with their own bands. Mm -hmm. But people, like, they weren't, like, known. So people were like, what the hell is this? So I went to, like, all the suburbs, and I went, I promoted for nine months, and I found all the shows every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I would go out to the different suburbs, to the different concerts. And I was putting flyers on people's cars and I was passing them out. Oh. And I ended up selling like 1,000. Uh, I ended up selling out. And I ended up selling. And, I, and Detroit is a type of place where people don't buy tickets ahead of time. So, so they, only, they buy like mostly walk-ups. Right. So like the day of the show, I had only sold like 300 tickets and I was just like, whatever, I lost my money. It's fine. We're going to have a great show. And then my friend called me. It was like around six o'clock and she's like, pipe, is that your show at the garden theater? And I was like, yeah, she was like, girl, the line is wrapped around the corner. Oh, I was like, what? Oh, and I ran God. outside and I was like, ah, I was so happy. I didn't lose money. I made my money back. But it took me nine months to sell a thousand tickets at twenty five dollars, and I was wow. hustling in the suburbs. That's incredible. Because in Detroit, they like titty raps and pussy raps, and <laughs> it's like if we were had people talking about like you know spirituality and uh, <laughs> you know like motherhood. <laughs> no, 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 don't say that. Wait, wait, who, who was my guys from Detroit? Some village? Who else? Oh Let's yeah, go. yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean you got Big Sean. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, we got uh, Clear Soul Forces. I don't know you know about them. They're really mm -hmm. good. Younger, younger act. They're cool. They're kind of in that same vein. Um, but we got, you know, we got Royce, you know. 
So, but uh, race is a bit rich for my blood. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't right, have them right. dollars. <laughs> well, last question about Detroit, and I'm gonna turn you loose. Um, yeah, the, Judge Mathis. Do we like Judge Mathis in Detroit? Because I have to say, you know, I'm quite Judge the fan. Mathis is a liberal, <laughs> but he tries to act like he's so hood and street, but he's like an Obamaite, isn't he? He's well, like a can I tell Judge you? Mathis is like, pull your pants up, Sunday. And, you know, don't do drugs and go to school and say your prayers. Like, he's just a... Uh, Kinda. He actually... But then he tries to act thuggy. He tries to act like, ah, you don't want it with me. <laughs> no, he does that too. He does that too. Like, I mean, I remember Judge Mathis' early days when he would still wear the, the, them gold Cartier frames. I said, look at this Detroit-ass nigga right here. <laughs> the Cardis. He had the Cardis on. Yeah, the Cartiers. It's Listen like, no, here, he's young like, man. But here's <laughs> credit. Like, so I so basically, and I'm gonna let you go. So I think they've actually canceled Judge Mathis. They are running like old shows of his from like 2016, mm. 2017, because his last live season, he would be very critical. I heard him be very critical of Joe Biden. I heard him be very okay. critical of Democrats. I, I heard him blame. The America and the CIA for putting crack in the communities and okay. locking everybody up. So you I mean, you can't be... deny that now, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. Waters. <laughs> so you know, considering you know yeah. that he was an elected judge and this, that, and the mm -hmm. third, he he got a little bit of radical rhetoric to him now. You know what I'm well, saying? Well, let me say this about that: everyone, not everyone, you'll find that many people in Detroit are quasi Muslim and quasi conscious <laughs> okay. because this is the birthplace of black consciousness. Mm. So you'll see people that'll be capitalists that love Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, you know, know about legal revolutionary black workers, Fannie Lou Hamer, but <clears throat> swear that black capitalism is the cure okay. and love and love Obama and love Obama. <laughs> and so, and love the police they oh, love the black police because mm. they think the black police love us <laughs> mm, mm, and mm. are in the streets, you know, uh, you know, telling like young people, like, you know, don't do drugs or whatever, you know. So Detroit is just one of those places where it's like um, it's like a birthplace of black consciousness. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So. And, and and all those things did happen here. And so there's a little bit of that infused in everything. So you'll even find like, you know, dare I say the conscious drug dealer mm -hmm. and you'll see the drug dealer that'll be like, you know, you know, Malik El Ha Shabazz, you know, my brother. <laughs> and then they'll turn around and say, like, when I was, when I, when I do a lot of, you know, door to door in my neighborhood, like the dudes in the corner will be like, girl, we can't get rid of these police. We need these police. And these are the dudes on the street. <laughs> yes. So there's like, so, but at the same time, they could, they could quote you a bunch of, you know, hip hop lyrics, but they could probably, you know, but they, but they love Fred Hampton. You know what I'm saying? So Detroit mm -hmm. is just that type of, you know, and they're going to sell you some drugs. <laughs> so, it's like that. Oh. <laughs> so that Detroit is just like, it's like that. I'm not saying everyone. I'm just saying you could find these kind of contradictions, as Coco would say. <laughs> no, right? I, I definitely think that uh, he he um, embodies a lot of those contradictions. You know what I mean? I've always I, I I don't know. I always find Judge Mathis to be an interesting character, maybe because I just watched him on TV for so long. I, like, lo I love him. I, I just know he's I know him. he's a liberal that know how to talk that that talk. He but, does know um, how to talk that talk. He he but, does have a program though. He I think he I think it was he has a whole Obama. center. He has a yeah. whole he has a whole Mathis community center. He says and he does I a mean, lot of again, stuff for black boys and so, for yeah. for people um uh <clears throat> returning citizens right people yeah, coming home yeah. like you know like so I I feel like he does put his money where his mouth is. I would actually like to have a conversation. Maybe you should see if you can get Judge Mathis on Beyond Breaking Barriers because. I, you probably I, should go on, on Jared Ball's show talk about uh myth of black buying power. That would be dope. I don't see, that would be is, dope. 
would would Jared want to talk to judge someone like Judge? Jared Jackson, wants though. to talk to everybody. He don't care. <laughs> Jared is never scared. That's what I love about Dr. Paul, man. He like, I ain't never scared. We let's talk it out. I'm gonna prove it to you. Let me show you my research. <laughs> show him the research now. You know, he, he, methodologies. He, yo, he always <laughs> Like trying to have like trying to have a conversation with with Jared, it's like you better have you better be Trump tight. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't be coming in there with no sort of like you don't be trying to renege. Don't be coming in there yeah. with you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> acting like you got some spades in your hand and knowing you only got three of spades. <laughs> like, don't do that with Jared Ball because <laughs> you could get exposed. <laughs> And that's what that's what I really appreciate about you know the, the the platform as as a whole. Like I think uh, the the way that that these ideas get proliferated and disseminated, um, I, I I I know it's ultimately helpful, and I think it's good to challenge people um, to th about these ideas, right? I think the mm -hmm. the myth of black buying power. Is something that so many people in our community have not even considered, haven't even thought about. Like, it's not, yeah. what do you mean it's a myth? You know what I'm saying? I'm yeah, just trying to get. Yeah. It's like, no, my my good people, y'all. Every every black person in America could have 800 credit score, and guess what? We would all still be broke. Okay, <laughs> like we would all still be broke. So I, I appreciate um, the, the the discourse and the and the challenging of these like status quo I ideas and making people, even if they react with hostility right like the mm -hmm. reaction tell is, is is telling within itself like why why mm -hmm. get mad so why would anybody get mad when presented with that Un mm -hmm. unless you are so dedicated um to to protecting and upholding the system and then you have to ask yourself why why is that <laughs> why why are you mm -hmm. trying to do that so. that's real that's a dope way to end right there yo oh. bars <laughs> you hit it with the Remy bars. Everybody, <laughs> thank you, Piper. Well, thank, thank you, you so thank much. you. You burned it down. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity to do so. I appreciate everybody that came through and checked in. What's up, Yipper? What's up, Latif? What's up, Rouse Pasta Sauce? What's up, Zinzi Bell? What's up, Afro Sings? <laughs> Appreciate yeah. all the folks came through. What's up, yeah, Pamela? Jamon Thank was you. in here and Pamela Jones and everybody's up in here, man. Poncho, man, y'all came through. That well, was that's awesome. Get y'all asses up tomorrow morning for the remix morning show, please and thank you. 8 a.m. Right? <laughs> Piper, <laughs> what's up? Yo, I mean, anytime you want to come on for Women's Wednesday <clears throat> or any, I don't give I mean, you can come on as far as I'm concerned. You can come on any day that you want to come on. But <laughs> more specifically, if you would like to join for Women's Wednesdays, I mean, that's an open invite. You just you just let us know. And I, I will ask air doctor i won't say i'll tell air doctor because i don't want him to do right it. tell me what the to boss do. <laughs> the boss <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't tell air, air doctor what to do air doctor tells us what to do so i will ask air doctor if he would send you the link if if you want to come no pressure you know what i'm saying i know it's 7 a.m no are, so. i would love to come because because uh y'all be doing your thing up there on the women's wednesday i'll be rooting for y'all <laughs> I'd be, I'd be like, go, 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 go. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be <laughs> listening and I'd be just, pr I'd be like, oh, I hope Ricky and Lucretia and Jackie show up because <laughs> I don't got no stories. I don't oh, got let's, no stories. oh, what was that day? Oh, wait. Uh, uh, I was trying to think, was it, was it Thursday? It was one of those days last week and you held it down because you had said something about, oh, I'm trying to hold it down. And I remember, uh, like all these people in the chat and even myself was like, you're doing your thing. What day was that? So Wednesday, it was just me and Ricky. And then Thursday, it was just me. It and was, it was Wednesday. It was Wednesday. Well, let, me, Wednesday. let me, let me, let me defer all the credit to my sister and over there, Erica Keynes, because let me tell you hey. something, the, the most prepared person on earth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm. like, and and I appreciate Ricky because number one, Ricky will tell you what she know, and she'll tell you also what she don't know, right? But what she do know, oh, mm -hmm. the, the, keep keep flowing free. You know what I'm saying? She she gonna mm -hmm. she, who who was that uh, rapper who used to do? He was known for freestyling. He was just freestyle. I think his name was Supernatural. 
super oh, natural. Oh, yes. Freestyle, 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 yes. freestyle. That's Ricky on geopolitics, right? Okay. <laughs> like she, okay. Like I she, love that. You can just keep it going. Like she's she gonna drop, she's gonna tell everything that she know. And I and I and 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 it's accurate and I appreciate it. And it's contextualized mm -hmm. and it's well thought out and analyzed. And she's gonna explain it in a way uh <clears> that is not necessarily talking over everybody's heads. I appreciate that very much. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, so thank thank you for that. But let them me also the, definitely credit uh Ricky in in yes, y'all were great <laughs> together. That was a good show. Thank you. That's very that was a great show. That. Yeah, y'all, y'all was flowing. I love that. So that's what's up. That's what I'm talking about. Like, that's that's what I want to see. That's that's like that that's what I consider that to me that's real hip hop. Yeah. That's hip hop culture. You know what I'm saying? Like just spitting like that and the way that you're just able to flow 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 and and you just know maybe it's your training but you just let it go and it's like I feel like I'm this is what the radio should be. You know? Like when I when I hear you speak so thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Piper Carter. I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Whew, well, all okay. right. Well, I'm going to play our... We, we out of mm -hmm. here, y'all. Y'all better come back to Black Power Media at 8 a.m. Eastern and, and check out the morning show. Remix. If you know what's good for you. <laughs> no, but if, if you want to, want to hear some great news and get some good laughs, right? So And know what the hell is going on. So, try. uh, right. Or at least try, <laughs> try. but we're going to get out of here. I'm going to play yeah. my outro. I'm going to take you. us off the stage Thank and you, I'm going to play my little outro and, um, uh, we'll see y'all tomorrow morning. All right. Thanks gang. Peace. Peace y'all.